Right, yep. we're live. Excellent. So hello, everybody, and welcome to this very, very special live stream version of the Titanic sinking animation. So I'm with all of my team in my Discord server. And for my first birthday on my YouTube channel, we have all come together to react and talk about the Titanic sinking based with the new animation by Titanic Honor and Glory, who I like to thank for allowing us to use the footage to talk about in this live stream. So I'm with all my amazing friends, including Jake, DK, Hannah, Sabrina, and hopefully Sam when he comes on of Historic Travels, but um, with Jax as well. So we've all come together to talk about Titanic. So before we start, we just probably want to point out about what happened. So. Jake, would you like to kick us off on what happened um, before the events took place? Yeah, I can, yeah. Um, so before the Titanic struck her iceberg, um, just at 9am, at uh, 9pm, sorry, around 9pm, Captain Smith had uh, had retired to bed and left um, uh, a second officer light on in charge of the, the ship on the bridge. Um, and then uh, later, Murdoch would take over the watch um, from uh, Lytala and uh, everything seemed calm and quiet um, nothing out of the ordinary um, the sea was calm uh, there was no moon um, in fact Captain Smith uh, actually commented earlier saying that the sea was that calm he'd never seen such seas in his life uh, it was like a mill pond uh, which then I believe Lytala made a comment of well, wouldn't that make it harder for us to see the iceberg because there'd be no clashing against the base of the iceberg? Um, now, Frederick Fleet uh, and Regident Lee had taken over... Uh, sorry, had taken over the watch from um, uh, uh, Archie Jewell and his partner. And, everything, like I say, everything seemed calm. It was really cold. There was no binoculars in the, in the crow's nest. Um, so, you know, it was even harder to scan the ocean, I suppose. Um, and then, suddenly, around 11.40, well, say at 11.39 p.m., uh, the, they'd seen an object come out of the, the distance, and it seemed that the, there was a, an object in, in front of them. So they rang, uh, the bell. Crowsness bell three times, and and rang to the bridge and reported to um, Officer Moody uh, that, that uh, they'd seen an iceberg ahead of them. But by this time, the iceberg had already been spotted, uh, and uh, they were already taking uh, evasive action. But unfortunately, by the time they'd seen the iceberg and the collision, it literally took 30 seconds for them to, um, for the impact to take place. Uh, they had stopped the engines. They hadn't reversed the engines as um, films and documentaries and things like that in the past has um, had the ship do, uh, which wouldn't have been the norm. They stopped the engines and allowed the ship to glide. Um, and also uh, Murdoch had ordered the ship to swing to harder starboard, which is... You would swing the ship, the rudder, towards port, um, and that would swing the bow around. What the the whole idea of it is that they didn't want um, to do a head-on collision. They wanted to see if they could get around the object, um, uh, but unfortunately, it was just not possible. And the Titanic uh, did a glancing blow down the starboard side. But during the collision, uh, Murdoch had changed um, his direction and head and harder, harder, uh, harder port uh, to port around the the iceberg. So basically, steer the ship towards the iceberg as the iceberg is going down the starboard side. And um, what that the whole idea of that is to so that the ship wouldn't get damaged in the stern area. So they were trying to protect. The stern area and the propellers, um, so that, that not that there wouldn't be that much damage, uh, you know, being done. I mean, they weren't aware that at this point that the the ship 
had opened too many compartments and the damage had already been done. Um, after the collision, uh, Murdoch had ordered the watertight doors to be closed and uh, then seconds after uh, Captain Smith came on the bridge and he said, what have we hit, Murdoch? And uh, Murdoch said, we've hit an iceberg, sir. And uh, straight away, Captain Smith um, ordered the carpenter to go and sound the ship for any damage and for Mur and for Thomas Andrews to be awakened so that Thomas Andrews could also go and do some inspections because Thomas Andrews was the designer of the Titanic so he knew the ship he knew the design of the ship so he would probably be able to give uh, a decisive decisive answer of what's really going on with the ship there you go <laughs> <laughs> well I know that um, also the um, impact had like something to do with it but with the iceberg co um, contact it only took about seven seconds from what I understand mm. and then what you said uh, Jake about the drifting towards um, the south south west after the yeah. iceberg collision um, upon it um, it did stop drifting towards the south south west and then mm. it stopped and then it traveled at one knot before coming to the final stop and I yeah. believe the positions between the final uh, coordination of where Titanic sank and the iceberg was either between three or three mm. and a half miles away from the spots from each other so that means like either three or uh, three and a half miles away from the iceberg basically yeah that's right yeah uh, also what's happening as well is they're going to restart the engines for at least a couple of minutes um, because they you know Captain Smith was still unaware of what was happening to the ship he at this point he did not know the extent of the damage he did not know the extent of what was really going on um, so he started up the engines again and they ran for a couple of seconds and then they stopped the engines completely and that would be the final time that the engines will ever be um, started up she will be dead silent for the forever basically so and uh, you c can't imagine really how difficult and hard it must be really with mm. all, all those things going on and no one can predict on what's going to happen and all of that as well so would anyone like to point out um like um the other stuff that's been going on but i think um sam just walked into the chat sam of historic travels hello hey what's happening Hey, you, you didn't miss anything much, really. We only just got um, past the iceberg collision, so we've only talked about like what happened. Would you like to add something to that with the iceberg collision? Uh, okay, so we're at 11.45 p.m. Um, you have to pardon me. I'm actually a little under the weather today, so... Oh, no worries at all. <laughs> yeah. uh, let's see, so we're at the iceberg collision. It's 11.45 p.m. Um, initial inspections are going on right now. Uh, Captain Smith disappears not long after the collision. He showed up on the bridge, uh, asked Murdoch what had happened. Murdoch told him about the iceberg and the watertight doors are closed. So then Smith headed off to do an inspection. Where he went during this time isn't exactly known, but he returned to the bridge a short time later. I think around 10 minutes after the collision. He, I believe it was also around this time that Henry Wilde showed up and reported that he could hear air escaping, or maybe that happens a little bit further down, but um, I think it was coming from the um, the Four Peak tank. He talked about that. So yeah, there's all kinds of stuff happening. It's the early stages, and I think water is, I don't think water's hit the mail room yet. I don't think that's happened yet. It happens a little bit later on, I think, and because it's still... I'm in the early stages, but then the water's coming up to the boiler rooms and the deck as well. DK, did you want something to add on this? Yes, for this one, since I'm actually a good specialist for the Marconi guys, Phillips and Bride. However, for them, around the time with the iceberg collision, it felt like more of a slight rumble as the bow brushed the iceberg. And of course, five to ten minutes after the collision, you know, nobody relayed any information to them whatsoever. And right now, we got the steam actually venting out through the funnels. And they operated under a near maximum steam pressure. Now, unlike gas or fuel on ships today, you cannot switch the steam off or you'll risk a uh, boiler explosion. But however, 
<laughs> the steam is made by the boilers, and basically the steam is sending it into the massive engines, and the steam engines turn the propellers, thus propelling the Titanic across the water. Now, however, the pressure that night was over the maximum limit actually started to vent out with the use of the safety valves like what is currently going on right now. It's actually extremely loud that whoever's on the boat deck would have to shout at the top of their lungs, cover their hands, and get close to someone, whoever they're talking to, and yell. And uh, you can imagine, really, because that went on for quite a while, didn't it? That it did. And it was actually difficult for our Phillips and Bride to hear the dots and dashes due to the steam pressure venting, which is actually going to happen just a little bit later on. But this was right before Captain Smith kind of walked in to the Marconi room and told him, hey, Star Prep and sent out a distress signal, but do not send it until we're ready. And it did quite, take quite a while because Captain Smith, once he found out the situation, he went up and down the decks, really, just to try and inform everyone of what's happening. He went to the officers' quarters, he went to the Marconi room, and at some point he went to see the musicians down in their cabins as well, from what I understand, with news research that's coming up. So it, it's been all over the place, really. And same with Thomas Andrews. He's been like finding out what's going on and realising the situation, which is going to come up later on. It, it's all hay going and it's all haywire. So, um, Jax, do you want to add something to this? Or, oh no, it's not Jax. Who who else have we um, got? We, we definitely have a few people in, really, but I think everyone's just gone a little bit quiet. <laughs> There's a lot going on right now. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think Hannah. right over... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, on the actual ship itself? <laughs> yeah, I think right now, what time did it just say? 11.46, 11.48, what time um, did it... Oh, there, boom, right there, 11.49, okay, there we go. Um, so it's right around now that Captain Smith returns from his first inspection, and then he heads to go and meet up, I think he leaves around midnight. He goes and meets up with um, Chief Engineer Bell and Thomas Andrews in the ship's engine room, but that happens later. I, I feel like we're jumping ahead a lot. <laughs> We're jumping ahead quite a lot. But I think it's right around now that the mailroom is starting to flood. Oh, yeah, that, that's definitely around about this time as well. And then it, it's not too long now because everyone just thinks the water is uh, rising fastly. It is fast, but not as fast as everyone would think, really. And then it's because of the watertight door system, from what I understand. Right. So it was the um, the only crude areas that were flooding right away was Boiler Room 6 because it was directly impacted by the iceberg. And then shortly after that, the mail room. And Smith, Andrews, and um, Bell arrive there much later. But they get there and they see the, the mail clerks scrambling to pull the mail up. So right now, I'd say water is just about ready to come in and then the mail clerks are going to start moving it because... The mail room was a two-story complex. I believe it op occupied the Orlop deck, and um, or no, was it on? No, was it uh, was it the Orlop deck and then G deck? I think I have to double check. Oh, yep, yeah, there's the mail room. Okay, there's the mail room in the animation. So it's on the bottom floor of the mail room, and the crew are working to try to get the mail up onto the top deck. But this is like the lowest parts of the ship right here, or is that the cargo yeah. hold? I think that's the cargo hold. Yeah, it looks like the cargo hold on the mirror, but that looks so scary from what you can see because you never would expect that, really, because um, that, that's just the amount of detail that's gone into it. And I mean, first time I watched it, I, I was really scared like you were on the Titanic and you would either think, OK, this is a, um, a survival of the fittest, either it's a sink or swim type of thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh 11:47 p.m. That's what time the mailroom started to flood and it was G deck and the Orlop deck. That's it. Yeah, that that's definitely it. And Jake, can you tell us what happened next following that? Um yeah, I mean basically the uh, Captain Smith uh a little bit later on, he will because everyone thinks that Captain Smith didn't take a, a active role in you know the evacuation or preparing for the evacuation but he did um you know you will see in a moment that he actually uh, orders the lifeboats to be swung out um and the other thing is well boxall 
said that he didn't see any damage. There was no water. Uh, he didn't see anything, out, you know, out of the ordinary. Um, so there was a few reports saying that there was damage, and there was reports from Boxall saying that there wasn't. Um, you know, it, it's it was just a, a very confusing night because you know um, you've got Thomas Andrews and the Carpenters and and you know uh, Joseph Bell, Joseph Bell and and all the others doing their inspection, and then Boxall is going off and doing his, and he recollects see it, saying there was no damage. Um, the other thing is, uh, what well, you know, this was a very unusual night. You know, the, it was very dark. It was cold. Um, you know, a lot of the passengers, some of the passengers noticed that the engines had stopped because you've got to imagine the whole way through the voyage, um, they got used to this hum of the engines and suddenly it's, it's completely stopped. It's, it stopped dead. Um, one in particular, particular person who was very observant was uh, Lawrence Beasley, second class passenger Lawrence Beasley. He noticed um, when the iceberg did strike that, that it, it, he said it wasn't anything, it, didn't, it wasn't alarming but he said it felt like just the extra heave of the engines um, and because he, he, I think he had a, wa a glass of water on on his on his desk next to him. He noticed that the uh, water had sh had shook. Um, it had been disturbed. Um, and then he noticed because uh, he was quite observant during the voyage as well. Because he noticed the three degree list, um, which was due to the um, fire that was on board the ship, uh, the smouldering fire. Uh, the, the, there was a, 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 a three-degree list to the ship on the port side because what they were doing was to get the fire out, they had to dig out the coal from the coal bunker that was on fire on the starboard side and put the coal, the good coal, shall I say, um, over onto the port side, which then added more weight onto that side. And lights, um, I know uh, Lawrence Beasley noticed how, uh, when he looked out the window, uh, there was... Um, the horizon just wasn't quite um, straight, if you know what I mean. Um, it wasn't out of the ordinary. So he was quite an observant man, and he was one of the particulars that were very observant during the during the sinking. He noticed, you know, that he, when he was going up the second class stairwell, he noticed that his feet just wasn't catching the stairs the way they would normally. He noticed the engines were off. A lot of the passengers did know that there was something unusual uh, but they obviously was not aware of the significant danger that they were in um so there was just so much going off um you know in the early stages um so yeah <laughs> although but yeah. that's a really good thing though oh did um, sam did you wanted to add something to this i just wanted to say you told it well <laughs> you, Thank yeah, you. Lawrence, yeah, Lawrence Beasley is one of the big reasons why we have so much information about the sinking. Yeah. Um, I don't know if this is true, but I have heard that as the ship was going down, he was actually making measurements. Okay, the water rose this high in this amount of time. Like, he was... Um, I can't remember if his cabin was on the starboard or port side. Ah, there's the mailroom. Okay, so there's the mailroom going under right now in the animation. That's what we were talking about earlier. And when did, I think, um, shoot, uh, shoot, Light Holler. Was it Light Holler or was it Box Hall who arrived in the mailroom just as it was going under? And he made a note of it. And he went back up on deck. I can't remember if it was Box Hall or Light Hall. Does anybody know? Box Hall, I think. I think it Box was Hall. Box Hall, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, Box Hall arrived in there just as water was getting ready to hit the G deck level. And um I was talking about Lawrence Beasley. Does anybody know if his cabin was on the starboard or port side? Ooh. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Not off, I, not off the top of my head, no. Yeah, no. cuz I just I recall I can't remember if it was him or somebody else, but uh there was somebody who survived that said ice came in through their porthole window and landed on mm. them in their cabin. Gosh, yeah. I mean, that's a bit terrifying. Hannah, did you put your hand up? Do you want to say something? So, 
um, because um, everyone knows really with the California situation, it's one of the biggest parts in the Titanic story. And um, there's still speculation and debate about what happened with the Californian. But if you read um, some of the history books, including uh, Samuel Hartburn's S.S. Titanic, um, a centennial reprosal, I think that's how you pronounce it right. But um, one of the writers in that book goes into the incredible amount of detail with the S.S. Californian. And I think it was historian George Behe. And uh, it's definitely worth reading, I think, because it is really interesting to look at it in that point of view. And the water is just coming up from past the mailroom and it's probably going up to GDAC, I think. And it was next seen in the squash court, from what I can yes. see. Yes, you're right. Yeah, so uh, Sabrina said uh, Lawrence Beasley's cabin was in D56, but Lawrence Beasley wasn't the only one, really, because um, I think with the actual collision itself, third and second class passengers would have noticed a bit more. But then also um, we are going to go into other survivor stories like um, a second class passenger, uh, Albert Cardwell. Now, I have been in contact with his great niece and um, we've always had a talk about him with his story. But apparently um, Albert really didn't hear um, what happened until the Titanic's engine stopped. But his wife, Sylvia, she woke him up because she felt the collision. But Albert thought, oh, I'm just going to go back to sleep. And um, the engines have stopped. And then they just went out on deck to see what happened. And then a steward came along to say, oh, we struck an iceberg, nothing wrong. And then Albert went back to sleep. But it was only a few minutes later that all the family was told to get up on deck. And it was the same with um, Eloise Hughes-Smith or Mary H Eloise Hughes-Smith and her husband Lucian, which we'll, we'll probably go into more detail with that quite soon. DK. All right. Yeah, those little lights in the uh, horizon that's in front of the Titanic, it could be the Californian, but who knows. Now, the Californian was within range of the Titanic, but you got to remember, Bride and Phillips were actually working with a, a land station called Cape Race in Newfoundland, or MCE, which is about 400 miles away from Titanic, or the call sign is MGY. Now, think about this. All ships and land stations have a unique three-letter call sign. Think of it as a license plate on your car which is a perfectly good, good example. Now, for Cape Race, they are much further away, and the problem is, the further the away the location is, the louder you must have your radio turn up just to hear the faint dots and dashes of the Morse code. So, at this time, you know, there were no different frequencies back then, you know, no different radios and all that stuff. While Phils was actually talking to Cape Race, and this happened at 11... 07 p.m., the Leyland Liner, the SS Californian, at this time was actually 20 miles or so, messaged the Titanic and let them know that they were surrounded by ice and had to stop for the evening. When the Californian messaged them, Phillips happened to have volume up so high because due to communicating with the Cape Race because they were so off, so far out, it actually produced a loud ring in his ear, which actually forced him to yank the headset off of his head. And figuring out what to do, he actually sent a rude rebuttal to the Californian or the MWL saying, keep out, shut up, I'm working Cape Race, and quit jamming. And basically the operator was like, okay, no problem. You know what, I'm about to go to bed anyway. Don't say I warn you. And you know what they say, 1140, the rest became history. Absolutely. And um, also, uh, Harold and Jack, they played a big role in the disaster to come, really. And I'm sure we'll be touching on that extremely more. And uh, we're just coming up to midnight on the 15th now. And as we can see, um, the Titanic is listing a little bit, but um, it was noticed um, hours before, before the iceberg collision, but it's getting a bit deeper now that it was before. So you can see in the animation that um, um, some of the stuff is going down. And I believe in this animation, it's the smoking room that's taking their heavy lift port down because it's near... Um, by the Titanic's nose or the bow, or the nose in the bow. And um, it, it's starting to get a bit noticeable now, but um, a lot of people haven't realised, especially first class passengers or some passengers, they don't realise how actually serious it was until much later. Um, did you want to add something quick about the situation once um, everyone noticed that the Titanic was doomed? 
Oh, no. Um, Jake. Hello. Um, do you want to add something quick about um, the results um, from Thomas Andrews' report? Yeah. Um, a lot of people think that uh, Thomas Andrews was not... Um, it didn't give the Titanic much credit in its survival, its, its survivability. Um, he only gave the ship an hour, maybe an hour and a half uh, to live. Um, and basically, this man knew the Titanic like the back of his hand. Um, he wasn't originally the designer. It was actually Alexander Carlyle. He took on the role of chief of designer after Carlyle left the, the company due to ill health. Um, and... Um, Thomas Andrews took on the design, and by this time, Titanic was almost complete, but because he had been involved in Titanic's construction, he knew Titanic very well. Um, now, originally, what he calculated was that the Titanic was going to uh, roll over onto a starboard side, and this is because uh, this type of class of ship tends to roll. Um, if you look at other shipwrecks such as um, the Lusitania, the Britannic, uh, you know, other shipwrecks that have sunk, they've all rolled over. And this, this is what Titanic was going to do. So his calculations was that the ship was going to roll over within an hour, maybe an hour and a half. But the fire on board the ship may have actually helped Titanic in a way because that uh, three degree list to port actually the the, the titanic uh, shifted over onto a port side so it kind of counteracted what titanic was going to do um and uh, that sort of uh in a way helped her stay afloat just that little bit longer you know thomas andrews calculated it right it's just that what he didn't take into consideration was that extra weight on the port side but it's also very um, interesting how as soon as the port list started to take hold that's when Scotland Road also started to submerge so you know it, like I say it, 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 you know Thomas Andrews knew the ship he knew his ship he knew what was going to happen he wasn't stupid you know and he thought the ship was going to roll like all the ships do so, so yep. we're, we're just coming up to the animation now where the lifeboats are prepared to be lowered. Now, there is one story um, about what happened to one of the lifeboats that, um, that nearly caused an incident, but we'll get to that later. And that's around about this time where the lifeboats were being ordered to swing out that um, the final report between Andrews and um, the Captain Smith um, it was being confirmed and concluded. So we're getting up to five past midnight on April 15th. And what happened next is that... Now, I want to talk about the lifeboats quickly because lifeboats as well, it played a huge role in the disaster because there is a law that um, was partly to blame for the disaster. Now, this law um, was um, actually released by an organisation called the Board of Trade. And it, basically, it's a law from 1894, which said that the Board of Trade regulations um, for lifeboats was based on a ship's tonnage more than the number of passengers were on board. And that played a huge effect in the disaster because um, there many lifeboats weren't being filled. Um, there was, even though there was um, a lifeboat drill back in Southampton on the 10th, it wasn't really well thought out really because a lifeboat drill was supposed to happen after Sunday service on April 14th, but that unexpectedly got cancelled. And we still don't know to this day why that was the case. But, yeah, I definitely think with the lifeboats, I, I definitely got into a little bit more detail in that. <laughs> Sam, do you want to um, point something out quick about anything around this time? Um, with what you were just saying about the drill being cancelled, there was a running uh, theory, like it's just a theory, but they were talking about how leading on Sunday uh, they did have the drill in Southampton, but the ship was making excellent time. They were still breaking in the engines, and 
the theory is is that due to the fact that the ship was performing so well and it wasn't due to like a speed record or anything the titanic wasn't going for a speed record but because the engines were doing so good they wanted to just let the engines keep running they didn't really see the point to stop the engines lower a lifeboat pull it back up and everything when they were going well Plus, it was Sunday morning, church services were going on, so they didn't want to disrupt the pastors. Now, the pastors wouldn't have been involved in the drill, but it would have affected things. So that's the running theory as to why the, that I'm aware of, that why that drill got cancelled. DK, do you want to add something to this? Yes, not to mention they also did a, a lifeboat drill at Southampton before departure anyway. Right, right. There you go. <laughs> oh, I want to add that in. Oh, you boys were on a roll with that. <laughs> That we are. <laughs> no, sorry, sorry, I'm I'm losing my voice. I was filming today and I randomly got the chills and I'm like, Ugh. oh no, it's <laughs> <Sorry>. alright. <laughs> uh, anyway, <laughs> yeah. So um, we're just coming up to almost the time now. It's not going to be long until the first lifeboat was being launched, but I believe it was lifeboat seven that was the first to be launched. Oh, Sabrina says in the Discord chat, now there are people who are typing in the chat, and Sabrina is one of them, um, saying, um, dark, dark, cold, and rickety. Oh, do you mention that with the lifeboat, Sabrina? Was it um, rickety as well as being dark, cold, since it was a moonless night? I think that you mentioned that, but Jake, you got your hand up for that. Yeah, um, just to go back with the lifeboats, is, is that um, in those days... You know, when a ship sinks, they usually sink in shipping lanes. Um, so usually, in normally there would be a ship near enough to come to the rescue. So, you know, they didn't have covers on the lifeboats. There were more ferries than anything. Um, the British Board of Trade, their attitude towards it was, um, even though that Thomas Andrews um, and Ismay and all those uh, wanted more lifeboats on the ship, and in fact they, the davits were built to take more lifeboats. Uh, uh, Titanic was originally going to take 48 lifeboats on board, uh, but the British Board of Trade's attitude was: is is your ship safe or isn't it? You know, um, that was their attitude. Um, but you know, Titanic was actually breaking the law. Um, she carried four more lifeboats than the regulations required her to. Um, she There was four um, extra uh, collapsible lifeboats on board. Uh, so she was kind of breaking the law. Um, although, you know, we, we look at it as, what if Titanic had more lifeboats? Would they have been able to save the people? Well, you've got to look at it. They, they had to float two of the lifeboats off. Um, and you also got to imagine Titanic is supposedly, or she's sold as unsinkable, and people have got that into their minds. And it's late at night, it's, it's, it's midnight, and you've been woken up, and you're told to get into a lifeboat in the dead of night. And, you, and especially the first class, you can imagine the first class paying, what, £50,000 in today's money for a first class ticket. You know... You're getting wake up, woken up and people are saying you've got to get off the ship, it's sink, you know, there's, there's, there's trouble. Um, you know, you're going to go like hell, you know, I've paid £50,000 to step for the ship, you know, to, to, to go from, you, you, no, you're not, you just patch it up and let's go, you know. They, they had that attitude of, um, they, they just was in a, what they call a false sense of security that they thought the ship was safe and it wasn't and uh, that's what also helped delay um, in uh, filling the lifeboats but also you know only one I mean one lifeboat only left with 12 people you know that's it's just crazy um, but just people weren't taking it they just didn't know the, the seriousness of the situation um, that they were in and uh, you know and also uh, the crew were very they were not no they, they were not used to the the well in davits at all i mean they thought that filling the lifeboats to full capacity that that, that would um overweigh the uh the, the davits and the davits would just break off the wooden deck um so they were kind of scared at filling the lifeboats to full capacity as well so um it was just at first it was a really really slow process but then you know as the ship 
and people started to realise that the ship was in serious trouble. You know, it was slightly, almost too late. You know, <laughs> so. Um, but it's it's been really interesting with that because I never knew about this, but it's really interesting to see the Titanic did break the law, but. If it wasn't breaking the law, more lives could have been lost. But if it did, like it did, more lives could have been saved. But it would have been proper to have like a proper lifeboat drill um, on board, really, depending on what happened, um, cancelled or not, um, on the, the 14th of April. Then who knows what will happen? History would have been alternated as well. Sabrina says in the chat, you also have passengers looking at a bright, seemingly solid Titanic versus a small lifeboat. And I can see why nobody wanted to go in at first. Yes. Especially with the women and the children. Now, it's by this point, really, that some of the first class passengers left their cabins and they either took shelter near the grand staircase or in the gymnasium near the boat deck. And that included the Astors. And it was reported that um, John Jacob Astor actually um, got off for his life belt and showed Madeline Astor um, what it was like inside. And, um, and it's around this time as well that the Titanic um, band, but even though they weren't part of Titanic, the musicians um, went up uh, from their deck in the E cabin and um well not e-cabin e-deck thank you pardon and um what happened next is that they went up the grand staircase and uh, they began to play to calm the, the passengers down all in while that second class it didn't really bother people so much but in third class there was a lot of panic by this point and no one had any idea that was going on no one was trained no one um not everybody spoke english it, it was just a bit chaos down there. Even the, the staff who worked at the restaurants, really, they were hold, held back, really, um, because of their work uniforms, which was something that I never expected to do, which is a bit shocking. Oh, DK, you got your hand up. Oh, the, I think we lost DK. <laughs> but, um, yes, so... Sorry. Um, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, my mic was turned off again. Dang it. <laughs> all right. We all good. All right. All right. This is at the time where uh, Titanic began to send out his first distress call, which is CQD, DQD, CQD, MGY. Now, I actually looked something up from a book called Titanic, James Cameron's illustrated screenplay, and it actually uh, refers to a radio distress code in use at the time. CQ actually means to stop transmission and await information and D actually indicates distress. Now, however, a little bit later on, the first vessel to actually respond to the CQD was the SS Frankfurt, or DFT, but this ship was only 130 to 150 miles away and was able to unable to provide any assistance. But the biggest issue that actually does lie with the Frankfurt, that it's a German ship and the operator are Germans. And had any messages, had to be translated into German, which means that anytime Jack Phillips or Harold Bright had to transmit and translate as well. So around that time frame as well, Box Hall arrived, learned how much of a serious condition they're, they're in. Now keep in mind, Smith actually wrote the wrong coordinates. They were 20 miles off. Box Hall took the corrected position to the Marconi operators. And even though that it is slightly a little bit better, Box Hall's coordinates are about 13 miles off to where they were. They weren't negligent at the time. They both made a mistake. And it actually resulted the Carpathia to sail into the wrong coordinates. Now, speaking of Carpathia, by luck whatsoever, Harold Cottam, with his shift about to end, actually arrived back in the Marconi room one more time to listen to any, any more incoming messages, you know, just what's going on in the outside world. He just happened to hear the distress call and jot down the coordinates. Mm. Also, we're hearing now in the background that the band are beginning to play and their first um, um, song that is believed, it's called The Flower Song, which I didn't really find out until recently because it, it wasn't included in the documentary that I did about the musicians. But, wow, there we go. <laughs> 
and I think it's almost around that like, time, really, because what time did um, the animation say we're up to? Was it 12.25 or 12.30? Well, I might have to double check on that one. Um, I, think but... it was, I think it was 12.16. Oh, oh yes, yeah, so a bit more earlier than that. It's also right around this time that I think it was... Like, even at this point in time, Titanic is still not yet declared doomed. Uh, it's been about seven or ten minutes since Smith, Andrews, and uh, Bell saw the, the mail clerks pulling the mail up from the now flooded mail room. And Andrews went off to do his own inspections, and Smith came up to the bridge, and he saw them swinging the boats out. And it was somewhere around 1220, 1223, 1220. It was right before the first distress call went out, which is about to happen in the next 10, 15 minutes that Smith talked to Andrews, and Andrews told him, yeah, we're done. So that's coming up in the very near future. Mm. And so, yeah. uh, oh, sorry, Sam, go on. <laughs> yeah, so but yeah, I just that's a lot of people like to say, oh, they didn't get the lifeboats. Like they, it took them an hour to launch the first lifeboat, which leaves at twelve forty, I think, lifeboat seven, and all that. But they had to be sure, you know, they had to be sure because it was throwing Andrews off how well the Titanic was holding up. And you commented earlier about the coal fire that was because the ship was holding up so well, it was confusing Andrews a bit. But when he saw what was going on in Boiler Room 6 and everything, yeah, he he knew. He's like, yeah, we're done. We're done, so. That's it. You can I, imagine, like, the look on the faces, though. It must have been terrifying. A passenger, I can't remember their name, but they said they saw Smith running up the grand staircase, taking two or three steps per at a time. Like, he was in a full-blown, and they said he had a look of terror on his face, which is probably happening right around now. I mean, that must be a bit awful. And then around the same time, or a little bit before, um, it was recorded that the Thayer family, um, they bumped into Thomas Andrews, and that's where um, Thomas Andrews, I believe, um, spoke to Marion uh, Thayer, and uh, that was uh, uh, Jack Thayer's mother, and... I believe from what I understand and that Thomas Andrews told her about the situation but no one was panicking but it's, it's best to be safe to get into a lifeboat for that, that's probably from what I understand yeah so we're getting to see in the animation now that, that there's people just coming up the lifeboat deck and I believe that was from um, mainly from first class yeah, the third class were, um, I don't know if they had started to be mustered yet. I know the second class were in their space towards the back part of the ship. I forget what deck it was on, but they had their own, uh, like, lounge area, or was it the restaurant where they all met up? And the steerage passengers were also being arranged, but they would never receive proper attention throughout the evening. It's not due to the fact that they didn't want to help them, it's just... There was a lot going on, and they just did not get the proper care that they should have. Mm, def definitely. And um, also, it always come up to that point as well. But it's later on in the thinking that um, third-class survivor... Um, oh, goodness, I've forgotten her name, but I know I spoke with her great great granddaughter as well and um, because i did like an interview with her and apparently um she tried to get off the boat later on in the sinking but because um there was no room to get to a lifeboat they didn't really know what to do so um a few third class passengers created like a human ladder to actually help her and her baby get onto a lifeboat safely and that was just before the final plunge i wasn't That's aware of that story Oh no, oh, it's, it's really incredible, um, I couldn't believe it as well, and because um, uh, um, the great-granddaughter, she's a professor, and uh, they did a recreation of that um, many years ago with her university students, and it was just so hard to believe really of how they did that, and all in such a small space of time as well, because they knew too little too late, it was going to happen there, but, but she said that um, there was no way, there's no evidence to support that um, a lot of people in third class were being held back. Um, she said that there was no way that it was. 
and but so they didn't have the proper training to help third class passengers to get onto the lifeboats or even go up the deck so the only people that were told to back down or back off to wait for a lifeboat or wait their turn or not go past at all was mostly the staff members who worked in the a la carte restaurant and this is new research that just came up and uh, what happened with um, the secretary of the a la carte restaurant was actually noticed that um, most of the people who worked in the restaurant were being held back because of their work uniforms because they only just finished off their shifts and there were some stewards were like no you cannot come onto the boat decks you've got to stay put and um, a lot of um, the people were just like waiting and handing around but he and a few others um, went past the boat deck just because they were in their pajamas they weren't in their work uniforms and that's how what one of them survived and i think that's round about that time as well that our famous famous well-known guy charles jocklin comes onto the scene <laughs> right <laughs> so sam i think you know like more information about charles and you definitely are a huge fan of his story from what i gather <laughs> Uh, good old Charles Yalkin, quite possibly the Titanic's greatest hero, who made it his mission to make sure that the ship went down with as little alcohol on board as possible. <laughs> uh, now, all right, now to give him credit, he did not start off the sinking buzzed. I mean, he did do his duty. He was going to man a boat, but he let um, a female passenger get into the boat. And I believe it was after... I did do a video on him, but it's been a while. No, no, no. So what happened was he went to the kitchen, sent his crew up to the deck with bread, went down to his cabin, had a shot of whiskey, <laughs> and then <laughs> went up to the boat deck. His cabin was actually on Scotland Road. And then uh, went up to the deck. He hung around up there for a while. The boat he was supposed to be on already had crew, and so he let a female passenger go. And then after that, he's just like, eh, yeah, I'm not going to survive. I'm just going to go wander around and blah, blah, blah. Um, he did do a few other things. I made a video about him. I just I can't remember everything off the top of my head. But eventually he did make his way back to his cabin very late in the disaster and walk, waded through water along the Scotland Road corridor to get to his room to get his whiskey. The man had to save his whiskey. He just had to. And then he headed up the crew stairs and headed back up to the deck and went to the A-deck pantry, got more whiskey, or whatever alcohol they had in there, and then he could hear the ship breaking apart. Then he headed to the CERN and he wrote it down like an elevator, his words. Mm, that is really fascinating because um, everyone says in the chat, we salute you, Charles. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. <laughs> um, hey, Sabrina, I think I'm going to step away for a little bit. Um, I will try to come back later, but yeah, I'm going to hop out of here for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Sam, no worries. But, um, if we don't see you, thanks for coming on. No problem, and thank you. And I should, I, sh I will try to come back here in a little bit. Okie dokie. But thanks for having me. No worries, Sam. All right, bye. Bye. And um, yeah, so we definitely got Charles on there. Oh, I do remember the lady who I mentioned with the humor ladder, Leah Ask, uh, third class passenger Leah Ask. That's the one uh, that I mentioned um, earlier. So w what's going on now is, I th yeah, it's 12.25 a.m. Jake, can you tell us what happened at around that time? Yeah, um, as we've just seen in the in the description that Thomas Andrews has um, seen all he's, he can see. Uh, he's seen the damage. He knows what's happening to the ship. Uh, he races up the, the grand staircase. Um, I believe uh, stewardess uh, uh, Sloan um, actually spotted him and... Although she knew Thomas Andrews and she said that during the voyage, he was quite a bright faced, uh, quite happy. But he, he, he talked a lot about about, about his family. Uh, he just because, well, not long, long before um, uh, the Titanic was launched and everything, he became a dad. So he had a, a, a young child. Uh, so he, he missed home and he would talk about being, you know, missing Belfast and missing his wife and his child. And he, he couldn't wait to, to get back home to them. Um, so he would talk to Salone quite a lot about that. Um, but in but when uh, she saw him, he he seemed a shadow of himself. Upon like he he was grey faced. He, he you know that you could tell there was something wrong. And he was racing up the grand staircase, um, missing a few steps because obviously he was quite in a rush. 
and he went to the bridge and told Captain Smith that um, the he's seen all he can see and he has calculated that the Titanic will sink and um, and that uh, she would last within an hour, maybe an hour and a half, maybe two. Um, and then that's when the the evacuation of the ship really starts to get real. And the, also, uh, it's just one of those things that it, it just happened, really. It was just all a bit of a shock. Yeah. I mean, also, I mean, Titanic was designed to stay afloat with four compartments completely flooded. Um, that means that she could float up to two, maybe three, you know, in different sections. Um, and, uh, in fact, Thomas Andrews would comment on this quite a lot, how, um, you know, how unsinkable she is, um, that she's a safe ship. But, unfortunately, the Titanic's bulkheads only went as high as E-deck. And uh, that meant that there was no watertight deck to stop water from flying from one compartment to the next. And when the Titanic struck the iceberg, she opened six compartments. That meant it was, you know, two more than she could withstand. And that's when Thomas Andrews had calculated that he'd seen these six compartments now flooding, that it's now, that's her death toll. You know, she's got, that's it, the Titanic's doomed. So, yeah. And then we're just getting to see as well that a few people are getting into the lifeboats. But um, it, but from what we understand, Lifeboat 7, the first lifeboat, wasn't launched until 12.40 a.m. But And there was a reason for this. Yeah, so it was definitely a reason for this, really. But it's again, it's just the proper training. And, um, and then there, there, was a, there were loads of things going on that, that um, everyone didn't really understand or or a gap really and then the ship um you can see the list being there but it's almost taking a heavy list but not quite but it, it looks like it was nearly there but it's also around about that time that um um eloise smith and her husband lucian were coming out on the deck as well but unfortunately um uh, eloise um had the time really where she learned the truth about what was going on and um, unfortunately, she wasn't really too happy about leaving her husband. And it was later on that she um, was encouraged to get into lifeboat number seven. And it, it was just around this time that Lucian persuaded her to get in. But unfortunately, she fought tooth and nail to actually stay on the Titanic. And she, she protested... And as she scrambled a little bit, because Lucian picked her up by the waistline, and um, there were some men who tried to get into um, one other lifeboat, which was lifeboat number eight, but he held them back by pushing the gentleman with one hand while holding Eloise's torso in the other. Yeah, so it, it, it's just all a bit chaos, really. And then... Even earlier on into the sinking, there's um, there's a lot of um, dramatic stuff going on there as well because men were so desperate to get into the lifeboat that everyone was trying to hold them back for preventing them to get in to um, help as many women and children as they could. It wasn't just the officers, but it was the first-class male passengers like Lucian. They were all doing their part with it as well. And it was also, I believe, around this time where um, one, um, no, actually, um, it was around about this time that um, the ship's designer, um, no, not the ship's designer, let me rephrase that. Um, it was around the same time that the chairman of the White Star Line, J. Bruce Ismay, got into a frenzy panic. Now, Jay, can you add something to that? Yeah, yeah. Um... <laughs> It was actually uh, an encounter with uh, Ismay had an encounter with Lowe. Uh, it was when it was around about the time when lifeboat number uh, five was being launched. Um, he went into some sort of panic, and he was, you know, really trying to rush Lowe to lower this lifeboat. And Lowe just obviously didn't realise who he was talking to. Um, had said, "Just get back, you know, leave me alone, you know, if if." If we rush this lifeboat, we're going to just drown everyone. The, the ship, you know, the boat will just, you know, it would it would not be let it would not be lowered uh, with enough concentration. 
to lower it safely. And um, and Ismay said, do you know who you're talking to? And then he said, you are a passenger. And Ismay said, he just, he just sort of was took back by that. And he said, yeah, I'm a passenger. And he just walked back and just left low to it. You see, Lowe was not a very light officer uh, on board the Titanic. Um, he he was he was quite um, he, he was quite ambitious, and sometimes he would overstep the mark. You know, he was the fifth officer. There was higher ranks than him, and he would overstep the mark a few times. And he he just wasn't very liked amongst the crew. And in fact, Lowe was not told straight away that the Titanic was sinking. Um, it was actually, he was, wake, he was awakened by noise coming from outside his cabin. That's when Lowe um, then got up to find out what the hell is going on. And then it was late. Then obviously he was told that the Titanic was actually sinking, that it struck an iceberg. So, you know, Lowe was, you know, the last to be told. So, yeah. Oh, that's just absolutely amazing, really. And I know that uh, Lo, uh, DK actually said the whole conversation that Ismay and Lo had with each other. You're a passenger and I'm a ship bloody officer. Now do mm. as you're told. Those were strong, strong, headstrong words. Yeah. Oh. But, yeah. um, yeah, so we're coming up to 12.33 a.m. And it's not going to be long until Lifeboat 7 is going to be launched. And, um, yeah, so with the preparation for the lifeboats, I don't think it's too long to go now until um, everything just gets dropped off. But how did everyone get into the lifeboats um, early on in the sinking? Because there must have been some way, either with, either with quickness or great difficulty. How did the people actually get into the lifeboats? Oh, I don't think everyone has the answer to this one. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I don't want to... Um, basically, uh, there was two ways they could have done it. They could have lowered the lifeboat to a deck, which they could put... Well, that was what they were was going to do later on, was they were going to put people through the A-deck windows. But unfortunately, the A-deck windows um, on the promenade had been locked, and no one could find the key. So, you know, they couldn't do it. Um, and uh, so what, so you would, so basically, um, cause everyone was, cause you would have to step over. There was quite a bit, bit of a, a you know, a, a steep step. You'd have to stretch your leg out a little bit between, you know, the boat and the deck and you would have to climb into the lifeboat. Um, you know, it, that's how you would probably, um, get into the lifeboat. So... Um, with always like great difficulty and DK and um, back in the, the wireless room something else was going on wasn't there yeah it turns out just like what I said uh, not too long ago and oh now we got the Carpathia the Cottom came back to wireless room just like what I said listen to any incoming messages turns out Capes Cause got some messages from loved ones from back home in Massachusetts Phillips interrupted him, saying, come at once. We struck an iceberg, says CQD, old man. Now, keep in mind, old man is actually a slang term for friend whenever they were actually communicating with each other. Now we got Cottom responding, should I tell my captain? And Phillips says, yes, come at once. Cottom learned what was going on, wrote down the coordinates, rushed to tell Captain Arthur Rostron, and he tried to notice... No, that not notice. Notify the bridge officers, tell them what's going on, and they basically laughed at him, saying, "Oh, the Titanic isn't sinking. Someone's pulling a leg on you." Now, keep in mind this: there were trolls back then in 1912, just like the internet now these days. But hey, people never change, don't they? So, Cottom busted through the captain's cabin and told him what was going on. Rostrin already irritated and very disgruntled, but once he got the telegram message. Rostron just kind of shifted gears and say, okay, let's uh, turn the, the ship to the Titanic's coordinates and racing at full steam to their position. Now, keep in mind, they're on a New York to Mediterranean line. And then at that time, 
McBride was actually sent by Phillips to notify Captain Smith that Carpathia is going to make 17 knots and at full steam in their location. But the sad realization is it's going to take four hours for them to get there. And at that time, they would be way too late. And I mean, also as well, because um, you've got to think about really of how the distress calls have picked up. Because a lot of people said Carpathia was the furthest away from the Titanic. No, recent research actually said it was the second furthest away. The ship that was most furthest away, though, was the Olympic, the Titanic's sister ship. Yes, that is correct. The Olympic was about 400 miles away. And don't forget, at one point, all ships were actually communicating at the same time. So you got the Mount Temple, the Baltic, the Yerparanga, sorry if I butcher that name, the Burma, the Corona, the Asian, and the Virginian. They were all transmitting basically all at the same time. Now, think about this. If you're ever on the radio, like somebody, think about having multiple police officers on scene, you know, trying to get with dispatch. Dispatch, they're going to yell their heads off, basically yelling, Stop transmitting. I can only hear one officer at a time. And, uh, Which is basically a good analogy. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So Lifeboat 7 is just nearly hitting the water now. And um, it's one of the lifeboats that didn't fall, um, had its full capacity. Now, bearing in mind, I want to pause like there for a second uh, while Lifeboat 7 is just being lowered down. Um, there was this recent research that, that just came up and uh, another passenger who wrote um, about the Titanic was um, Archibald Gracie, first class survivor. And um, like Lawrence Beasley, he wrote a book about the Titanic. Uh, he went into like lots of detail about his experience and did an essay about um, the ship itself, what went wrong. And one of the sections that was pointed out was that he can have heard of how many people were in the lifeboat but each um one now bearing in mind archibald gracie didn't go into a lifeboat he stayed on the titanic until the very end and um he actually went um into great detail about looking um at the capacity of each boat and he actually estimated on what he believed that that um he uh, thinks that there were the number of people aboard on each lifeboat and it was very different to the ones that were recorded in the British Inquiry. Jake? Yeah, I just want to say about the, at least two occupants that are in lifeboat number seven. Uh, mm -hmm. There is Reginald Lee, who was obviously one of the lookouts that actually spotted the iceberg with uh, Frederick Fleet earlier in the night. And... Um, there would be Archie Jewell, who would also take charge of this lifeboat. And Archie Jewell uh, would later survive the sinking of Titanic's younger sister, the HMHS Britannic, in November 1916. So, there you go. <laughs> but um, definitely there were a lot of people um, back then who were in the boat. And I think the next lifeboats uh, that were launched were either eight or six now i have a feeling it is eight it was that it was lifeboat number five the next oh one. oh yeah. lifeboat number five thank yeah. you pardon <laughs> so now we've just come up to twelve forty a.m and then seven's just hit the water and then like you said jake and that number five is about to be launched but it didn't launch until like a few minutes later Yes, so um, there was a lot of people just coming out and you can see in the animation that there are loads of first class passengers that recently came out of the um, gymnasium. Oh yes, because um, DK pointed out in the chat that um, um, the first ships that were launched were ones that were launched on the starboard side and the first lifeboat, Lifeboat 8, wasn't lowered um, from the port side until 1am. And uh, yeah, so that that's a little bit um, of a little bit of facts there. But it's looking absolute chaos right now, especially from what um, Eloise Smith des uh, described really with her husband Lucian. And I think from what you can see in the animation, I think there was one man who's got a revolver. I don't know. 
but um, it's it's probably like hard to see really because the lighting at the time it wasn't as bright as um it was depicted in other stuff like a night to remember and james cameron's movie it was the lighting was a bit down than that it was a little bit dim, dimmer down uh, like what you've seen in the animation but what happened next in the wireless room dk i believe there was a little joke around this time Yeah, it's just basically what I've been saying about the whole, uh, oh, the Titanic is sinking, you know. Keep in mind, you know, there are some jokers and some trolls back then. Even in 1912, just like the internet in the United States, people never change now these days. Mm. But then also something happened, really, um, because there was a change of coordinates. And um, um, Harold Bride later on See. said, um, he said... Um, um, change it uh, because it's the new call and that new call was SOS oh yeah SOS is actually a uh, very easy to remember which is just basically the uh, did 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 da 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 did 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 and it's actually very easy to remember even on SOS if you were having like a tactical flashlight sometimes they will say it says say SOS on there and you can actually transmit it to where somebody else will be able to see it from miles away there's, um, also, um, Harold Bride actually wrote in his report, which was published in a newspaper later on, um, when he found out what was going on for the telegrams, Captain Smith was with them as well. He said, send SOS. It is the new call and it will be a last chance to um, you, you'll be heard um, or get the lifeboats or something. But <laughs> yeah, it was one way or the other, really. But they just thought, yeah, it was just a joke. And, but they didn't realise... Harold Bride's quick thinking and the joke actually saved many lives. Yeah, that is actually true. Anna, uh, hard to believe this, that was actually in the 1997 movie, but it was actually cut out in a uh, deleted scene. I actually happen to have a Titanic, which is James Cameron's illustrated screenplay. And I looked at that, I was like, oh man, right there. Mm. That's still pretty cool, but um, I know they mentioned it in the Night to Remember version, but it was only the 1958 film. Now, there was a 1956 television film, and there was a 1958 film film, but it was more featured in the film, um, in the 1958 film, more than anything. Yep, so the next lifeboat's about to be launched now, and that is lifeboat number five, as Jake mentioned earlier. Now, as you could see in the lifeboat, it wasn't uh, it wasn't full at all. And, but um, most of the lifeboats, apart from number one, were half full. Yeah, because um, from what you can see with lifeboat number five, the um, uh, people you know, were in there were in thirty six people. Where they, the, this lifeboat can hold sixty five, and that is really shocking because that's just about half of the um, original capacity. But, yeah, so do we know, oh, so boat, um, boat number five encountered some problems while lowing, but eventually reached the water safely. Jake, DK, can you mention this about it? Do you know what happened to lifeboat number five? Yeah, it was just it was just simply that the um the, the crew on board, that they just didn't lower it, um, you know, evenly. And uh, uh, I think it was Lowe and Murdoch that said, hey, you know, hold on a minute. Just hold that side and, you know, and then they lowered it, tried to get it even, and then they told them to lower it, you know, at the same time, you know, both sides. Otherwise, they would just tip uh, all the occupants into the water, uh, which wouldn't be a very good idea. Um, this just goes back to, uh, you know, how, you know, untrained the, uh, the crew were at lowering these lifeboats with the new... Uh, well in type davits it's just this was just all new to them so um yeah it, it they were just learning as they go along basically but uh they managed to get the boat away safely you know i mean it's sad really because the only lifeboat to ever fill to capacity the whole the, you know the whole night was lifeboat number 15 which is sad all the other lifeboats left at least half empty or close um and lifeboat 15 was the only one to be launched with with the boat full so 
Yeah, I mean, it's the training again, really. And then mm. um, there are some passengers were, who were a bit stubborn that night. Um, and also um, officers, even though they have a job to do and they have to get like quick action thinking as possible. Oh, we've got the first um, stress rocket out um, uh, that launched as well. Now, this is something really interesting with the distress rockets, but if Sam was here, he would have talked more about it because he really, really knows about this. But um, Hannah, DK, Jake or Sabrina, do you know anything about the flares? Yes, I do. Um, yeah, basically, the flares were distress rockets. Um, it was... Uh, they were sent up to uh, signify distress uh, to um, any uh, ships in the area. Um, but uh, there are reports of what colours the, like, the the rockets were. There has been uh, rockets seen on the debris field that had coloured tips on the end. Um, but it, it's, it was to do with the intervals in which the, the uh, rockets were sent up that people, you know, say the Californian, for instance, who had reported seeing these rockets, thought that the uh, ship was in no danger. Um, and that it, they must have been either having a party or some celebration on board, that they didn't really take these distress uh, rockets as, um, as distress, uh, which obviously, you know, it was, because <laughs> the ship was sinking. Oh yeah, and there was a bit for more in misinterpretation, and there was one other boat that was nearby the area. Now we don't know if it's true or not, but it's not the SS California. But it was believed with the um, distress affairs, uh, flares. Uh, uh, my speech is going over the place. Um, distress flares. Um, apparently, um, there was um, a fishing um, ship that was illegally hunting seals. And unfortunately, they took the flare signs as we know who you are and what you're doing is illegal. Keep away. And that ship, well, that little whale ship just rowed away. And that was another possible chance, really, that they could have been saved. So from what we can understand now, um, in the hearing background, we've got another uh, message being sent out. DK, can you tell us what it is, that message being sent out? Alright, Titanic's con being contacted by the uh, the RMS Olympic, which is his sister ship. And they are about uh, four mile, 400 miles away. Not four, excuse me very much. So basically, they got the Carpathia. They're about four hours away. And they're trying to get about many ships as they can to where they are at now. mean as well and there was more um coming about but then also there was um one a message but uh, that nearly went out but uh, jack phillips actually told them fool keep out keep out that would be the uh, ss frankfurt they've been having trouble to uh understand what was actually going on and jack phillips he was kind of like he didn't get any sleep the night night before the sinking and actually before the iceberg collision because the marconi system had to be a tear down in order to be uh, repaired and also put back together at the same time and which actually did violate the uh, Marconi rules saying that a te certified technician is allowed to service the equipment. He didn't have enough sleep that night and of course this kind of tops it off and basically he's going to start becoming and going into that trance saying, saying I had to get a ship somewhere to this location all the lives are going to be on me. True. And then, um, which lifeboat that was coming down? That's not... Um, was it lifeboat number eight? Uh, this one is lifeboat number three. Lowered away at 12.55. Okay. So, um, does anyone know what happened with lifeboat number three? We're all quiet as still as a mill pond. <laughs> so yeah, I don't think anyone knows what happened to life phone number three, but yeah. So we're at twelve fifty one AM now and um it's 
it's still calm there's no panic and um even though it's just like one of those things that does happen oh so the last of the excess from the funnels um is going away and uh, for once everyone can hear themselves think really a lot of people seem to think that it stopped when charles lightoller um said to captain swift shall i get the women and children in the boat sir and that was before lifeboat seven was launched but no that wasn't the case but yeah it's just like it's just like one of those things really <laughs> this time as well that um um that the musicians actually stopped playing well they did stop playing around this grand staircase early about 12 30 a.m and it was believed that they all went back down to um their cabins on e deck and uh, what happened then um was that somehow um some of them did see the water go up um their way really because um their cabins were also on scotland road and um, what happened next um, was that um, a few of them had to go down. Um, one was for a cello and then a few others, including Wallace Hartley, some coats just to keep warm because they thought around this point, ah, we've got to keep ourselves warm at some point. So, And it was reported that really that um, one of the musicians, and I think, um, I can't remember which one, but I think it was one or the other, but it's definitely not Wallace Hartley. And... Um, and uh, I, uh, I believe as well that we don't know what happened when down there, but the men must have thought, ah, something was wrong. So they went up on the boat deck and during that long brief period, they um, they were reported, um, especially um, one of them, they were actually reported to help some of the women and children into the lifeboat, which would happen until about like a little bit around or after 1.30 a.m. Oh, and this is the most saddest story that's coming up, really, in Lifeboat 8. Um, this is from a, a story of a couple called Isidore and Ida Strauss. Now, the Strausses were on um, their way back to New York. And um, sadly, um, when the iceberg collision hit and then they were getting into a lifeboat, Isidore Strauss um, wanted to step back because he was offered a place in the lifeboat. And, but Isidore said, no. I'm not going in while all the women and children are there. And um, Isidore tried to beg his wife Ida to get in and stay in the lifeboat with um, Ida's maid. But she went, no, we've been together for many years. Where you go, I go. And um, what happened next was that um, Ida stepped back out onto the boat and only the maid out of the party survived. And uh, Isidore and Ida Strauss... Um, were last seen um, on deck together and um, later on in the sinking only Isidore's body was ever recovered Ida's body was lost in the sinking and there was a recent illustration that I saw recently and it was just the most heartbreaking thing to watch really I nearly cried looking at that illustration and uh, yeah <laughs> So we're coming up to 12.55 a.m. but it's not very long until um uh, that the next thing going on so lifeboat 3's just been it's just been launched now and then it's not just about that time really and then we can see another uh, thing come up and i think that's another uh, distress rocket or an emergency lights are starting to switch on but there's kind of like a little red glow that's it's actually the uh, distress rocket Though that one is red, that means a distress. I know white is a company, and I don't know what the uh, the green and the uh, blue ones are. I know they actually did find a, a crate of rockets with the uh, colored tips on them. They did, and um, that was not recently, but um, that was back on one um, expedition to the wreck, and then some of them were never even opened. 
and uh, it's nearly come out to 1am now and lifeboat number six is just about to be launched really around this time now i'm going to go back to the smiths because what happened next to them was that um, they actually tried to uh, run to get to lifeboat number six but um eloise didn't want to be apart from lucian and then they came up to captain smith and um, Louise tried to beg the captain, saying, please, can my husband go in? I really need him. And bearing in mind, she was a few months pregnant at the time. But Captain Smith um, held up his microphone in front of her, saying, women and children first, which was a straightforward no. And um, <laughs> and then it, it was, I know it wasn't really funny, but um, you can imagine the awkward situation with the nervous laughter. And Lucian actually said, never mind, Captain, I'll see to it um, she gets in the boat. And then Lucian said these famous words to Eloise. I never expected you to obey, but this is the one time you must. It is only a matter of form to have women and children first. The boat is thoroughly equipped and everyone on her will be saved. And basically Eloise got into lifeboat number six with Molly Brown and Frederick Fleet as well, but tragically, Lucian didn't survive the sinking, and it was reported by Eloise, she um, actually retold her story later on, and um, she actually watched uh, Lucian um, as she watched above the boat deck, and he was um, um, smiling at her, waving to her, even taking his hat off, and up to the final moments of the sinking, she swore that she could uh, see him very far away trying to wave to her and then hanging on to the rails. And then to the last minute, really, um, even when the ship made a final plunge, she actually went to hysterics and um, she nearly swamped the boat almost because she was panicking and crying. Which was really sad when you think about it. And with the baby as well, never knowing its father, it's... It's awful. It's really awful. Oh yeah, so that's life but that's just coming down now. I don't know if it's number six or something else. Could be that. It's lifeboat eight. Oh life yeah, lifeboat eight. I forgot about lifeboat eight. So does anyone know what happened with lifeboat eight? Yeah, I think I think you kinda of mentioned a little bit earlier about the is you know, Isidore and Ida Strauss, they were gonna get on this lifeboat, or at least Ida was. And as you said, uh, they they owned a big uh, store in um, New York called Macy's, and um, basically they'd been married for forty years, and they were so much in love. It's it's unreal. They were, in a sense, the true um, romance of of Titanic because they'd been married for forty years. And you know, I also learned from. Uh, um, with the the uh, Strout Society, and also uh, when I spoke to um, Isidore and Ida Strout's great grandson, uh, he they they mentioned how they were so much in love that they would send letters to each other uh, if they were if they were apart, they would miss each other so much that they would send very um, rude letters to each other, but sort of very romantic what they'd want to do with each other if you know what i mean um and when they when they were bought when they bought it uh, uh, when uh, they're on the titanic um and when it was sinking they were going to get on the boat and uh as uh, ida uh, was with her maid and she was just stepped into the boat and ida then when she realized that um isidore wasn't coming with her uh, she stepped back out, back out of the boat and um she and I, obviously, uh, it was Colonel Gracie that uh, suggested maybe Isidore go in the boat due to his age um, with his wife. Um, and he asked the officer. But then Isidore, like you said, says uh, earlier, was that he said, no, I am not going. I am not going before the women and children that are still left on the ship. And I'm not going before any other man. And Ida looked at her husband and said, you know, We've been together for 40 years. Where you go, I go. 
and it's a true romance of they came sort of they were together for 40 years and they died together in each other's arms so although it was they were apart they were still together if you know what i mean through the letters that they would send yeah uh, I mean, it sounds like it really. They were the, like the um, the older generation, really, of what's called um, uh, being in the honeymoon period. By by the sound of it, but yeah, it's um, it, it's just uh, like really romantic, and it and it always makes me sad that story. <laughs> and uh, thinking about it now, it just think, makes me feel like oh, it's just a little bit sad. And DK mentioned about the. Um, memorial um, plaque or with the Strausses. DK, can you hear about it? Alright, forgive me on that one. I just had a sip of Monster Energy saved it for this special occasion. Yeah, they actually uh, dedicated the plaque. This is actually the same uh, department store that they actually do own and co-own as well. And I also did a little bit of research about Isidore Strauss. It turns out he was a, a member of the Democratic Party for the House of Representatives in new for new york so i can't imagine how the uh the house actually felt when they heard one of their former colleagues passed away be like quite sad really but i didn't know that but that was actually quite a good fact right so we've got we're seeing the water coming up to e deck and it's just gone past scotland road so you're getting probably where it's going to get really serious and water wasn't really noticed until like 1 30 but the turkish baths are still flooding and um and then the swimming pool's probably completely under by now and uh, interesting fact i've um we've learned that um uh, that um, there is still um chlorine water in the swimming pool um um uh, in the shipwreck but no one's found it yet <laughs> Okay, so now we're getting on to the launch for lifeboat number one. That is the one with the least amount of people. Only about 12 people on board, which is so shocking. But one of them, uh, one of the people who were in that lifeboat was in the, was the Duff Gordons. And uh, the Duff Gordons uh, were first class passengers, but they were involved in a really huge scandal after the disaster because uh, there was a rumour that um, Sir Cosmo Duff Gordon actually bribed, um, no gave bribes rather to um, people who were in the boat mainly um, the stokers or the sailors I think one of them or the other uh, to pay them to get away for not picking up lifeboats I don't know but I could be wrong so um, Jay do you know about that one? Oh no DK Sorry, Jake, I'm going to take this one. Yeah, you okay. go ahead. <laughs> All right. My best explanation is that if you're actually employed on a ship, and if your ship goes down, basically your time pay is stopped. So what I believe is that the Duffgorns actually paid the crew members on board, saying here's a little compensation from what happened. So basically the media kind of... Uh, took that saying oh he brought the uh, the crew members from not going back to pick up more survivors and all that i mean it is really shocking though because um people needed a scapegoat really especially the men yeah that's true mm. I, 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 I actually have a little known well unknown fact about the duff gardens they are actually related to a very famous actress today called Celia Imri. She's related to them. Celia. And Celia recently wrote a book about the um, the, the Teal brothers as well. And I've read the book. Um, it's called Orphans of the Storm. And uh, I'm even halfway through it, but it's basically told in the point of view of the mother of uh, the, the, the Teal boys and also the English, um, the, no, not the English, um, the, the lady who um, spoke very good French and the one who looked after them uh, for a few weeks or months before, um, uh, well, not before, after the disaster. And I can honestly say, really, it's such a good book to read. And if you ever um, get a chance, I would recommend reading Orphans of the Storm. But yeah, that's a really interesting fact. I didn't really know that, DK. I definitely think I'm if 
I had like extra money to pay for that really. I would love to have interviewed Celia. I just imagine that. Oh, that would be so cool. Right, so um so this is um probably what we're coming up to now is about the the gangway doors. Jake, do you know anything about the gangway doors? Yeah, um it's it's kind of a, a bit of a people in the past have said, okay, these doors were opened and they were left open because there was one door on the uh, port side that was seen to have been opened and that door has now since been recovered um, but uh, nobody on the port side that was lowered away in the lifeboats um, ever recollect seeing that door open even when it was still above water um, that they still didn't see that door open or any of the doors open so it it does beg to differ whether these doors were actually opened or not because um, Lytel had sent uh, the crew down to open them so that they could um, low, uh, fill some lifeboats up uh, through those D-deck doors. But whether they actually were opened or not um, is uh, sort of a grey area. But what we do know is that door that was actually opened is believed to be uh, uh, of um, uh, a consequence of whether the door was ever uh, sealed properly, and that when the uh, the ship struck the seabed, that the um, the impact and the force actually um, pushed that door open. Um, so we don't know whether that door was opened or not, or whether you know by human hands. Hands, but what we do know is that no uh, survivors that were lowered in the port side. Uh, forward port side um, section of the ship uh, ever saw that door open um, so yeah I don't it's 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 a grey area but I don't believe that door or any of the doors you know, on D-Deck was ever open by human hands anyway mm, that, that definitely uh, sounds like quite right really but um, it is shown like another animation and um, of the sinking and that was done by Tom Linsky and the team um, on Part Time Explorer, H um, FX Studios, mm. or no H FX Studios, that's it. And that they um, did a showing of uh, the gangway door being opened, and that but that was based on on a sea of glass. Okay, so we're coming up to lifeboat number six. That Eloise Smith was on there, but um, there was also another, uh, two other people in there. That was Frederick Fleet and Margaret Brown, aka the unsinkable Molly Brown. But M Margaret. She didn't really want to go in. She was very stubborn about it, apparently. Because I think um, someone tossed her into the lifeboat, but I can't remember who it was. I, does anyone know? Yeah, it would have been someone like Lytar that um, uh, that would have uh, coerced her in to get into the lifeboat. Um, but, you know, Mar Mar Margaret Brown was a very force to be reckoned with. She was raised with a load of, with a lot of brothers and she was quite, kind of a tomboy and she was she wasn't exactly um seen seen well in the in the line you know like in polite society they thought she was quite rude um she was quite outspoken and things and she she didn't seem very proper she, not not the 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 model the, mo the model of edwardian first class it was just she was still from a working class family, so she was she had that way about her. Um but she it, it, something transpired between uh, when when the boat was lowered and something transpired between um Hitchens who was actually at the, the helm of the ship when she struck the iceberg. And so and something happened. I don't know what happened, nobody knows what happened, but what we do know is that Hitchens later said, um, you know, why do, you know, M Margaret Brown could have got into any lifeboat that night. Why does she have to get into mine? You know, it, it, so something must have happened between those two to, for him to say that. Um, so whether she did do the famous, you know, if you don't row back, I will toss you overboard. Um, we don't know, but, something transpired 
and yeah. it didn't go into Hitchin's favour. So. TK, you threw your hand up. Yeah. I just, uh, <laughs> up. Oh dear. All right, Emma, let's get... All right. If you notice that Lifeboat Six actually did stop, they actually did have one seaman on board. So Charles Lightoller just kind of looked around and asked if there's any available seaman seaman around. So basically. The guy that actually leapt on the, to the ropes and down to boat six was a man by the name of Major Arthur Pukin. Who actually, when he was going down the ropes, he dropped his wallet into the Atlantic Ocean. And check this out. The wallet actually landed on the floor before the Titanic did. And the wallet was actually recovered. And now, around this time frame, the bulkhead failed, thus claiming two lives of Jonathan Shepard and Herbert Harvey. Is that, um, there were the first two lives um, that were taken during the sinking. Now, um, I did like a video on Jonathan Shepard, and it was really tragic because he had to go um, from one bit to another because he went back and forth to boiler rooms six and five. But um, in the end, really, um, he um, he couldn't have been saved, which is really tragic. And uh, especially with Archibald, um, with the guy that jumped into one of the lifeboats, lifeboat number six, um, there were a few men who tried to jump into the lifeboat, and some of them were rumoured to have jumped in the lifeboat dressed as women. But then also... Um, Speaking of that, really, because this is um, another bit to point out, because when I went to Belfast not too long ago, I um, came across um, a taxi driver who believes this ridiculous myth. And I say ridiculous because um, I think it was proven wrong. Well, I think it's wrong anyway, because there's no conclusive evidence. But apparently this is what some people in Belfast believe, that when um, Ismay got into the lifeboat he was dressed up as a woman but so uh, we'll definitely get to up to um uh, bruce's may later on really and um the ess californian so we're just picking up now um that with the morse code so the titanic is about to send morse codes uh, towards the horizon of light which is believed to be the californian I can answer that about why for that one. Basically, Cape Race has been trying to contact the Californian, but remember actually what happened earlier before the collision was that the operator went to bed. During the inquiry, the officers actually did testify they did saw a ship out in the horizon and they were firing flares and they just kind of stand there and did nothing. Now, it was no fault of their own whatsoever because they didn't know what was going on. Nobody from the bridge actually woke up the uh, radio operator and say, Hey, can you check out what this ship is doing out there? They've been firing flares in a uh, weird duration. Like, if I was a captain for the Californian, I would have done it. I would have said, Hey, there's a ship out in the distance that's firing flares for unknown reason. Check on it. We have a quote from Archie Jewell over there, um, Jake. And then that's one of the quotes because he did a testimony of that, didn't he? Yeah, he did. He took part in the um, in the Titanic inquiry um, after the sinking. Um, I think he he weren't asked many questions, but um, he was asked was he the lookout that you know was he a lookout? Yes. Um, what boat did you get off on? Lifeboat seven. Um, he recollects. I know after the the sinking, he could he he would he was so traumatized by the sinking that um, people would say that Archie Jewell would just suddenly burst out in tears uh, because he would remember the screams and the cries from the people on the ship. Um, it just really traumatized him, and then only to go and you know, serve on Titanic's younger sister, the Britannic, HMHS Britannic, in November 1916, and then again to escape with his life just through the skin of his own teeth because, you know, he survived by 
he was in one of the lifeboats that was churned up by the propeller. So, um, you know, not only did he, you know, go and survive the Titanic, but then he also went and narrowly escaped the Britannic sinking. So this man, you know, he's a very young man. He was younger than me to, to go through all these experiences. And then a year later after the Britannic to be killed in action on a sinking ship. It's just sad. It really is. It is really, really tragic. And then also, it, it actually just uh, was... I can't really a way to describe him, but he must have had some really traumatic experiences. Yeah, he did. Very. So we can see in the animation now that things are starting to pick up a little bit and people are starting to feel a little bit edgy on what's going on. And, uh, I mean, there's no panic yet, but everyone's just like, okay, something's not right. So uh, I think they're all um, going around together. And water is now seen flooding into Boiler Room 4. Now, Boiler Room 4 is, um, even though it wasn't really flooded because it, um, the iceberg, when the Titanic hit on the collision, the, um, the water didn't rush into life, well, not lifeboat, um, the Boiler Room 4. And um, but it's it's that point there that when it started taking water, um, the stress of the hole couldn't take on the weight of the water. Yeah, and uh, forgive me with that incident, really, but my brain's just a bit like ugh. <laughs> and, well, uh, <laughs> well, interestingly about like uh, boiler room number four is that um, it didn't just flood from the side or from the bulkhead, it actually flooded from the floor plates. People, uh, people. Uh, I think it was um, Patrick Dillon, who was known as the drunken um, uh, trimmer. Uh, he noticed when he was in, like, in uh, boiler room number four that uh, he saw water coming from the floor plates, so, which adds weight to maybe the grounding um, theory of the iceberg so oh yeah that's definitely really good but why was he called the drunken trimmer did he have the same amount of health whiskey as charles jocklin yeah he he drank a lot of alcohol that night and um it it's it's kind of hazy of how he es escaped the titanic it it is believed that he may well he said that he actually rode the titanic down into the water um, but he was picked up by lifeboat number four. So, well, if he had been, if he'd rode the Titanic down completely into the water, maybe lifeboat four wouldn't have been the lifeboat that picked him up. Because by that time, I think lifeboat four was close to the stern, but she had the, the boat had rowed away um, a little, little bit further. Because obviously there was the worry of the suction. So it might have been that. He was so drunk that he just some maybe stumbled off the ship and maybe fell off the ship and, and then was picked up by life, lifeboat number four. But yeah, that's why he's called the drunken trimmer because he was drunk. So. Oh, do you know what? We've got another hero. Um, so move out of the way, Giles Jocklin. Yeah. <laughs> <Joking>. <laughs> Oh dear. I think everyone's going to prefer Charles really to be fair. <laughs> oh dear. If only Sam was here for that one, he would have a right old ball. <laughs> <laughs> so we're coming up to nearly 1.20 a.m. And I think a lifeboat is just about to be launched there. Now, which lifeboat is that? Yeah, exactly. We're at 1.20 a.m. Good job, you guys. We're doing really well. <laughs> That's lifeboat eleven says. Oh, lifeboat eleven. Now, from what I understand, that's the lifeboat that the Beckers went on minus Ruth. Yeah, and Kate Phillips, and uh, Kate Phillips was on that boat as well. Kate Phillips, Jake. Yeah, um, Kate Phillips was. Um, she she worked in a in a sweet shop, a confectionery confectionery shop. Uh, and her manager was um, Henry Morley. He owned the shop, and um, it is believed that Henry uh, and and uh, well, they were in a relationship. They started a, 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 in a relationship. She was only nineteen at the time, um, so she was a very young girl. 
Uh, but Henry was married and he had a 12 year old daughter. And uh, anyway, uh, Henry had planned to uh, elope with Kate um, and they boarded the Titanic. Uh, but he sold some of his businesses and he gave the money or most of the money to um, his wife at the time and his daughter. It is believed the reason why they eloped and escaped on the Titanic was because Kate was pregnant at the time uh, with Henry's baby and um, Kate uh, when when they boarded the Titanic uh, they were under the assumed name of Mr. and Mrs. Morley um, because obviously they were not married and in those days uh, being unmarried uh, and obviously sharing the same cabin and everything was deemed on you know it wasn't seen in polite society or anything uh you were scrutinized for it so they was under the assumed name of mr and mrs morley and just before kate left titanic on lifeboat number 11 um henry apparently gave her a a, a necklace and um he kissed her goodbye and she boarded the lifeboat and as the boat, boat was lowered um it had been caught in the in the um, in the um, water that was coming out of the um, the uh, bilge the bilge the bilge, and uh, and unfortunately some of the water had got into the lifeboat, so it kind of uh, so obviously there was water <laughs> water around their feet, um, but luckily it managed to escape um, unscathed. So yeah. Mm. And um, I actually saw the necklace myself um, because the necklace was part of um, a artifact expedition, which is worldwide. And um, they went to London about nearly two years ago now. And um, I was um, invited um, like exclusively for the open press morning and I saw the necklace. And oh boy, let me tell you, it was such a jaw-dropping and a very spooky experience as well. I think that was one of the a few artifacts from the Titanic that actually gave me goosebumps. And also, fun fact, um, that necklace inspired the heart of the ocean in the Titanic. Yes, it did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, but it's so like it's really really surprising what you think but the necklace but when you think about it it is the same color and the gemstones the same but it's a bit smaller which is yeah. um which is uh, i thought it was quite interesting but you didn't really need like a like a big foot like carrot heart really because that would have been too heavy and then also in lifeboat 11 we got the backer family minus roof and um, Ruth Becker, with uh, her mum and her younger sister and brother, were travelling on the Titanic because um, they lived in India. But unfortunately, Ruth's brother got very sick. And if they didn't move to America, he would die. So the family boarded um, the Titanic as second class passengers. And uh, their dad, um, Ruth's dad, stayed behind in India. And... Um, when they actually uh, tried to leave the ship, um, there was not enough, um, um, well, there was room, but there's not much room for everyone on board. So um, even though they were trying to get ready to be lowered, um, Ruth's mum actually said, OK, it's a bit cold. Uh, can you go down and get blankets for me and your brother and sister? So Ruth left, went downstairs, uh, picked up some blankets and hot milk. But by the time she got back, lifeboat 11 was already being lowered and Ruth's mother said, get into the next lifeboat and do it as quickly as you can. So Ruth um, actually did that and she happened to be in lifeboat number 15 and got almost swamped, and which we'll get into in a minute. But, uh, um, Ruth get, uh, Sabrina said in the chat Ruth getting separated from her family that's terrifying, oh yeah and bear in mind Ruth was about 12 or 13 years old at the time so that you, that's more scary and more terrifying than it would have been but, uh, but um, she was the one, interestingly, she was the one um, who got told to shut up at a Titanic convention later on because um, no one believed her that the ship split in half 
But yeah, so that's Ruth Becker's story. Uh, Sabrina says in the chat she was a little older than my... Um, oh, okay, she was a little bit older. Yes, I'm she must have been 13. Um, I would have believed through. Yeah, I believed her as well. Okay, so the musicians are playing um, um, again. So by this time, the musicians um, have got together. Now, bear in mind, this is the only time they played together. And um, because they were all split up into a trio and a quintet, and all eight musicians played together for the very first time up until the very end. And uh, they um, were reported seen uh, standing outside the first class entrance and um, trying to play as best they could with the musical instruments. And they started resuming again um, after um, some of them helped women and children into the lifeboats. Now, it's not recorded where um they were and um, during the women and when the musicians put the women and children in the boats it's still not recorded but um but they all did play together but then the tone of music did change um later in the time and then they stopped briefly which will probably or may not go into a bit more detail but on the short note that um, they did stop briefly just before 2 a.m. because um, they weren't given, um, they were given lifeboats, no, not lifeboats, they were given life belts, but with the life belts, um, none of them had the life belts on, and out of the eight, only three of them did. And the three people out of the musicians who did put their life vests on were the ones that were, uh, whose bodies were being recovered. So, um, I mean, that's just so amazing to think about what's, what's happened there to them, really. You cannot really think how terrifying it must have been for them. Now, so Walter is reaching up to E-deck by this point now, and it was just so really clear to see go up the staircase, and we're at 1.28 a.m. Now, what? And then lifeboat number 16's been launched, and I believe that was the lifeboat that... Um, had um, like a few incidents where revolvers were being shot. So, yes, DK. I can answer that for you. It was actually lifeboat number 14. Now, I actually do have a model in my hand trying to act like Sam. So basically, there was actually a mob of men that was actually underneath lifeboat 14. And Lowe fired off three warning shots away from the ship, telling them to back off and calm down. Now, keep in mind this, we actually did learn about that there were actually four guns on board the Titanic. That was courtesy of our good friend Sam that was on here. And they were actually entrusted with the uh, senior officers, which is basically Captain Smith, Wild, Murdoch, and Lightoller. Hey, do you've got something to add as well? Yeah, just go back to Lifeboat 16. There was a very another interesting character on board. Um... Uh, person, shall I say, uh, was Violet Jessup, stewardess Violet Jessup, um, who again would later go on and survive the sinking of the Britannic uh, in 1916, Titanic's younger sister. Um, Violet was, when she was placed in lifeboat 16, um, she referred to the officer as Mason, but it was more than likely uh, six, Sixth Officer Moody. Um, she said that she was handed this baby and uh, when the, uh, they said just take care of this baby and the boat was lowered away and she said the next uh, she, she said the next day um, when, when they were on the Carpathia this woman just came up and just took the baby away from her like didn't even say anything just came and took the baby and she thought that that was the, the mother and later on in life um she said that uh, on a stormy night in her cottage, um, uh, that uh, she she got a phone call, and on the end of the f she picked up the phone, and on the end of the phone it was this gentleman, and he said, "Do you remember the night the Titanic went down?" And uh, she goes, "Yes, I do. Do you remember a baby being handed to you?" And and she said, "Yes, yes, I do. I was that baby." And she said to John. John Maxton, uh, Graham Maxton, that um, that was actually doing her autobiography. Uh, she, he said, well, the kids, the kids must have been playing around and the, and you know making jokes, you know, prank phone calls, and 
Violet said, no, John, I didn't tell anybody about the Titanic. I never told anybody about a baby being handed to me. So it begs to differ whether that was the baby. Who knows? I mean, it's still a mystery, and it will always be a mystery. And but the good old Violet, we always love her, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so water's just filling up Scotland Road now. Now, Titanic's taking a dangerous list to port now, and it's quite clear that people are starting to realise now, OK, we've got to find a way to get off. So um, Robert and Frederick were just cut the ropes round about that time and you can see from the animation that was a very close call. Yes, so um, what happened was, as well, speaking of that, and we'll probably have to get onto the water because if lifeboats, or well, the occupants of lifeboats 13 and 15, um, they, when they actually went into the water um if they went did went into the water then they would have been the first ones to die of hypothermia uh, or um in other cases really like i always believe ice burn and uh, we'll probably get into that a little bit more in the, the later on oh dk you mentioned that in the animation there was a 401 being stamped on the propeller blades yes when i did that narration for the uh, switch theory i did talk about the one of the propeller blades that was actually with the shaft bent it up when the stern actually smashed into the sea floor. It actually didn't bend the shaft up. If you actually look at the propeller today, you can still see 401 labeled on there. Now, back then, when b both ships, the Olympic and Titanic, were under construction, they have a yard number, which is 400, which would be the Olympic, and 401 would be the Titanic. And Anything from machinery, parts, furniture, life belts, lifeboats, anything. If it goes to 400, it goes to the Olympic. If it goes 401, it goes to the Titanic. And of course, model moment as well. Both of them in my hands. And then as we can see right now, um, we um, are seeing water, which is uh, flooding up to first class now. And it's getting to that really dangerous point now. Um, where the lifeboats were nearly gone. Now, we just saw that lifeboat um, number two had been launched, and that was the one uh, that was occupied by Boxall. And Boxall actually get, uh, gave an interview in the 1960s, from what I understand from the BBC, and uh, he was speaking about the gangway door of trying to get some passengers to go around. Now, would anyone like to speak about that? I can answer that one for you. Okay, DK, fire away. Basically, for our lifeboat two, they were under orders from uh, Captain Smith to lower down into the water and go around the ship, which basically means around the stern and around the propellers, which is now starting to rise up out of the water on the uh, starboard side gangway door. But however, as we know, the time went on for the ship to go down, and by the time the stern was completely up out of the water, Box Hall abandoned that idea and just rode away from the ship. Just get away from it and just save yourselves. I mean, I didn't really blame him because in a way he was trying to help, but you couldn't blame him actually. And we're starting to see the point that the lights are becoming cutting out now and the electricity is at a point now where it's actually starting to um, actually go out. And uh, number 10 has just been launched, but it's the one that's nearly full to capacity, but not quite. Now, what happened in lifeboat number 10? Jake? Um, not going back to, obviously, I'm not uh, uh, number 10, uh, the boat. Um, going back to the power uh, of Titanic is um, through the whole voyage, uh, as you can see, the smoke coming out of one of the, uh, the funnels is that... Um, during the during the sinking, they had to keep one boiler room um, empty, and it was reported it was boiler room number three that was generating the power because it was further back from the flooding. And um, anyway, uh, they they had to keep the dynamos going, 
uh, the, the emergency dynamos, and that was to basically uh, generate power for the lights and the Marconi. Um, but as the Titanic gradually was sinking, the, the power was um, uh, diminishing, and uh, you know, uh, Titanic lost um, c contact with Cape Race. It lost contact with uh, Olympic and all the other ship ships that it had been in contact with, um, and uh, and also you, you, you'll see that uh, the lights will start to become dimmer, so they go from a yellow to to an orange tinge, which means that basically that is it for Titanic. She is that's she's dying. Um, that's and um, that's basically what was what was happening so okay you mentioned that in the marconi room um things were taking a turn for the worse weren't they can answer that as the ship is losing power now i actually do have myself a huge radius at the moment it is not to scale anyway right in front of me the ship is actually being envelope and it has a huge radius for the wireless system you can transmit it up to 400 however the power begins to dwindle down and so is the range of the wireless so right now the the first one to be lost is cape race they cannot be able to hear the titanic and olympic wouldn't be able to hear the titanic as well so that means that radius is actually getting smaller and smaller as the power begins to dwindle so once it goes into the late before the final plunge, they cannot be able to hear anything unless if they use their emergency set, to which it will provide some uh, um, messages, but it will just won't go fully. Um, also, it's got up to a point, really, because um, uh, um, uh, during most of the time, um, out of the two wireless operators, it was Jack Phillips who was trying to send most messages. And Harold Bride did a little bit part of it, but not as much, really. But Jack Phillips, since he hadn't got any sleep, he tried his best to keep going as much as he could until the very end. In the chat, who had the last contact with the Titanic before she lost her ra uh, range? It would be the uh, Virginian, which is uh, MGN. They basically asked the Titanic to uh, try their emergency set, and unfortunately, it was that late into the sinking. And basically, later on, somebody broke into the uh, wireless room, tried to take the life jacket off of Jack Phillips himself, and Bride saw that when they were getting their personal belongings. Fought him off. This actually uh, got John Phillips out of a trance and just used a blunt object and just knocked out the guy that was stealing a life jacket off of him. And that will be uh, like long, uh, right until the final moments. <laughs> I can hear like a meow in the background. Is that one of the kitties? Yeah, that's uh, either Smokey or Cubby. Oh, they definitely want to be part of the show, don't they? <laughs> that they do. Oh, hi, Smokey. Hi, Cubby. Anyway, the distraction from cat moment. <laughs> Beautiful angels that they are. Oh, they are. Oh, they're so sweet. Okay, so back to not being cat distracted. Um, it's coming to one fifty a.m. right now, so it's not long to go now because they're just on the last few lifeboats left. And it's not long now till they uh, launch the collapsible lifeboats. But just not yet, but it's coming up very, very soon. Now, this lifeboat, which lifeboat is that? And I think it was either, it was mentioned, it was either number four? It's number ten. Oh, number ten. Right, gotcha. And Sabrina says in the chat, I'm going to assume this is where people began to panic. Yes, that is right. Because um, people were realising there's not enough lifeboats left and everyone was just starting to panic. Especially with the third class passengers down below. Because the third class passengers, some of them have probably already died from drowning inside. Okay, so we come to 1.50 a.m. and we're about 20 minutes before um, the Titanic um, gets lost in the waves now. 
half an hour left. Yeah, half half an hour left, not 20 minutes. <laughs> Thanks, DK. Thanks for pointing it out. Um, yeah, so it's um, it's not looking good by the way, really. But you can imagine when people have seen it, they're just like, oh, no. And that's when we're all chaos breaks loose. Oh, Sabrina says in the chat, a whole mass of third class women and children ran on, onto the deck and apparently saw no lifeboats. Oh, that's a good point to bring out. Jake, do you know anything about that you can point out to Sabrina? Um, yeah, I mean, it, because obviously, I mean, the thing is with third class, I mean, some of them were, you know, foreigners and, you know, um, immigrants and things and you know sometimes it, it it was it was hard for them to to read english uh, or even to understand english um and they they probably kept what it was it wasn't that they were held back like we said before it was just confusion and obviously these days um you know you have uh, what they call deck plans which can show you how to get up to a certain deck on titanic they didn't have that you know um third class were kept in third you know in third class you know, uh, in steerage and and um, second class was kept in second class, so on and so on. And some people just couldn't pass, you know, or just couldn't pass themselves, go past a, a, a gate that would say, uh, you know, couldn't bring themselves, go past the gate that said second class only or first class only. So they kept themselves below. But um, there was one group in particular uh, called the Adigal 14. They came from a a village uh, in Ireland and uh, they were the people that came together from the village because it was a very tight-knit village it, you know they they were very close uh, they knew each other and um, I believe it was uh, uh, Catherine McGowan who came back from America to pick up her her niece um, from uh, from uh, to, to join her because her mother had just passed away I think it was Annie Kate Kelly and um, she she uh, Obviously, uh, sadly, Ka uh, Catherine McGowan didn't survive the sinking. Um, but it was it was said that there was there was men um, hurling women from deck to deck in in their hands just to climb the decks, uh, just because they didn't know how to get up there. And I think by the time they got up there, um, there was only a few lifeboats left, um, and only three out of the fourteen survived. So, so I think. By the time, you know, some third class did manage to get up onto the boat deck, the, most of the lifeboats had gone, uh, which is sad, really. Um, I know there was a, a Margaret Rice who was as well who probably didn't make it up to the boat deck in time to get into a lifeboat because she was with her five children. Uh, five, uh, there was, I think it was five children and herself and not one of them survived and i know that um she was last seen with the children clinging to each other on the a deck promenade and uh margaret rice was the only one to be picked up the body of margaret rice the children was never never found um so that's just to name a f you know so it's it was just a mixture of confusion um and you know mi mistranslation because some people just couldn't speak english and they were on an english ship and so yeah it, yes. it it was just unfortunate so yeah yeah i mean yeah. Language it's quite regards good. to the kids when i was doing research from my book 61 children died on the titanic 58 of them were in third class and at least two children were counted as part of the crew so they were part of the crew death toll, and one of them was only 15 when he died. And he didn't make it off the ship, obviously. And he was an only child, which is even more tragic. Because you just mentioned about, like, the bellboys there, Sabrina. Now, I never heard of the... Now, I know there, there were children, like, children and teenagers that were part of the crew. But I didn't really know about the two bellboys. Did you uh, know anything about them? Do you know... Uh, any history about something? When I was writing, when I was writing, when I'm, I'm still editing the book, but as I was writing it, I was trying to write down how many, because it's focusing mainly on the kids, obviously, but uh, I was only able to count the child, 
children passengers as far as the crew goes. I only know how old one of them was and that he was an only child. I don't know their names or where they're from. I think one from England and another was from Scotland, but that's as far as I got. I'm still looking around, seeing what I can dig up from those two. Rosie! Oh, we've definitely got another cat going on, really, with on Sabrina's end, but... Eat yeah. my dinner! No. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so we've got into the wireless operators now. DK, do you want to um, add, like, some point? Because I know that happened before the life jacket situation, but um, what happened then? All right, basically what's going on is the Carpathia's hearing the last messages from Titanic, which is uh, MPA and MGY, respectively. Captain Smith walked into the Marconi room, letting them know that they had done their duty and to abandon the wireless room, and letting them now know that it's every man for themselves. That last message right there to the Carpathia, or MPA, engine room full up to boilers. So Phillips actually took one good glance at Bride, and then he's still continuing to transmit. He still needs to try to uh, get a ship to their location, and Bride was actually annoyed with Phillips, and he actually started yelling at him, trying to get him out of that trance. So he's basically giving him more minutes to uh, transmit. And then and also... Course. Oh, sorry. And also we're coming to that point, really, where um, in Collapsible Lifeboat C, uh, Chairman J. Bruce Ismay just climbed in. And now J. Bruce Ismay, he was the main scapegoat, really, because he was the main chairman of the White Star Line. And um, what happened was that he just went in the boat. And that, that was probably it. And that was um, one of the, like, and the myth that I talked about with Ismay being dressed up as a woman by the taxi driver that I met at Belfast. I don't know if it's a myth that's well common in Belfast because that's probably what some people do believe. So, Jake, can you tell us more about Ismay? Yeah, um, Ismay. May uh, was um, on board as a passenger. It was not unusual for the chairman or someone from a representative of the White Star Line to sail on the maiden voyage of uh, these ships. Uh, he, I know he sailed on the Olympic when on her maiden voyage. Um, Ismay, it is. It, it's it's sad because you know he has been villainized, and I think. With any shipwreck or any disaster, there has to be that someone has to find a villain within it, and it's t kind of unfair if you don't look in look into the story deep enough. Um, Murdoch, uh, it is believed that Ismay just didn't take a seat. You have to imagine Ismay. Um, he 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 took an active role in t in evacuating the ship, and you and he also didn't get off you know the ship until the very last lifeboat to leave by the Davits um, on the on the starboard side. Um, it is believed that uh, Murdoch ordered Ismay into the lifeboat rather than him just take a seat. Um, but obviously, with him being the managing... Uh, it, it's as if history needed him to survive. It's as if Murdoch knew he needed to survive because Murdoch wasn't going to survive. Captain Smith clearly wasn't going to survive. And... You know, Thomas Andrews didn't. So we needed Ismay to survive because if Ismay had drowned that night, um, like the rest, it would have been one more story lost to the Titanic. We got his perspective because he was on the ship until nearly the very last moment. So we have now got his testimony. We were able to see through his eyes what was going on in that in those moments. Um so history really needed him to survive. Um, but, you know, Ismay was treated like a villain. People would walk on the other side of the road just to avoid him. He was a complete outcast. Now, he didn't, he didn't quit. He was, well, he resigned from the White Star Line. He did not um, get sacked from, you know, he did not get fired for, from the White Star Line. He actually resigned himself um he left on his own accord um but he did still have um a active role in the shipping business because i believe he took an active role in the british border trade i believe um 
but Isme was left a broken man um, after the sinking, and I don't think he ever recovered. And in and he sadly passed away in 1937 um, from type one diabetes. He had such ill health. I believe he lost a leg due to diabetes. He was in such poor health at the end, uh, and he eventually died um, due to the disease. And um, yeah, I just think history has been so cruel and so unfair to Ismay. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I speak to um, his relative quite often, Cliff Ismay, which is his fourth cousin. And he's just recently wrote a book about his cousin, um, uh, Ismay, uh, J. Bruce Ismay. Um, and it's called Understanding J. Bruce Ismay, which is a well-written book. And it really goes through the history of um, of, of the, the Ismay family and, the, and just Ismay himself. And, and, you know, I've said on many occasions to him that, you know, Ismay's been so poorly treated and that he needs to be given a little bit more credit than he than he has been um, it's just a shame it's too late for Ismay to hear these words now um, for us to for the public and not only the public but everyone to apologize for villain to, to, to uh, for making him a villain of Titanic but it is what it is um, so I'm just hoping wherever Ismay is, he can hear it now. So. And uh, DK pointed out about collapsible lifeboat D. DK, do you want to mention that? Yes. The last lifeboat to be lowered from the Davids themselves is collapsible D. Now, this one has a few interesting characters in this one. This one actually does have the kidnapped kids that were on board the Titanic. And there we go. We got the boat lowering away now. And also two friends that actually boarded the lifeboat from the moment it touched the water, which is Hugh Warner and Morris Stephenson. I think one of those two, I think it was Stephenson, actually filed one of the largest compensation requests for a painting on board the ship that went down with it. And I actually found that pretty interesting. Not sure how much it would be in uh, today's money, though. Wow, that's pretty interesting. Never heard about that. But then also we got um, another story because talking about children, we were also talking about um, earlier the Natival brothers, but then also um, probably the uh, Allisons because um, in the collapsible lifeboat A, now Sam did mention this in the video, there was this family, um, the Allison family, um, there uh, was the two parents and the children Lorraine and Trevor. Now Trevor actually made it off with his nanny in the sinking, uh, well during the sinking, and I believe they went onto one of the first few lifeboats, but the Allisons were trying so hard to find Trevor because they didn't know he was on a lifeboat, and um, because they were trying to find him, um, Lorraine couldn't be on the boat themselves because she's with her parents the whole time, but then they realised too late that they needed to get Lorraine in the boat. So what they tried to do at this exact moment was to put Lorraine and her mum into the lifeboat, collapsible lifeboat A. But then once it did that, something happened and um, there was water creeping up into collapsible lifeboat A. And Lorraine, her mum and all of those who were in collapsible lifeboat A didn't survive, which is really tragic. So we're just coming up to the last 15 minutes of the sinking now. So it's gone all really quiet now and I think the mood is sort of changing a little bit now. And so DK says you can hear the structure um, uh, bending already. So DK, can you um, want to go into detail in that, about the structure? Yes, the Olympic class, they were not actually designed to handle 
20 to 30,000 tons of water, especially after an iceberg collision. So basically what's going on is the structure is going to be getting ready to fail, and basically the internal structure is already it's beginning, but the total structural failure is basically when the ship napped into just right in front of the third funnel. Gosh. So we're starting to uh, realize that, okay, this is the uh, the final moments right now. Mm. And, and I mean, as well, um, it must have been quite a scary moment. Hey, do you want to add something to that? Uh, no, not really. I mean, I, was, I mean, D, uh, DK did a brilliant job at, at you know explaining what's really going on. And um, if you was if you was to put, um, I don't know, a, a spirit level on on the Titanic now, it would not be level because the the, the structure is bending as it's being lifted. Uh, it was uh, Charles Charles Jogan uh, Jogan who who actually. Uh, said that he entered a, a pantry on a deck and he felt the structure buckle. So as as the Titanic was sinking, it was already bending and st structurally failing. Um, but uh, a lot of people have said maybe it was the uh, expansion joint. Now the expansion joints on on the Olympic class were um, it was to it was like a suspension in a car. It was to, if the ship was in, in rough seas, it would bend. So you wouldn't necessarily feel the the, the impact of the waves. Um, but it wasn't the expansion joints because obviously the, the cracks, you know, the, the, the actual breakup was way in front of that. Um, because I know uh, the theory goes is that people thought, well, okay, they changed that on Britannic. You know, they thought, they, oh, well, our ship must have broken too. So they changed the design of the expansion joint on Britannic because of Titanic and it's not it's just because it was an evolution it was an evolution change uh, a design change um, that would because Britannic would experience more stresses because of um, she was heavier and she would ca carry these gantry davits so um, it wasn't the expansion joints so just to get that out the expansion joints were not the reason why Titanic broke up um <laughs> that's it and the carpathia as we can see is steaming away but she's not she's near close but won't be close enough so but that detail in the carpathia is beautiful i love the design of this and then another thing to point out is that there's a children's book called rescuing the titanic again it's a high recommendation i'll probably what i'll do is that in the live stream i'll leave all the book resources in the description box down below and so if anyone wants to have a read or have a look at them, yeah, I would really recommend them. As Sabrina just mentioned that the Carpathia is actually pushing her engines to the breaking point to which a ship like the Carpathia, it's really not designed to uh, take the full speed. It was only making 17 knots and basically there is actually a story where the chief engineer actually covered the uses had to cover up the uh, the dial or the gauge to not look at the top speed. It was like, I'm not going to bother looking at it. And basically, the engines would catastrophically uh, be a permanent damage for real. And just like Sabrina said, they were lucky the engines did not blew up. They were basically trying to divert ste steam from heating to the engines and try to push it that hard. And of course... These are the last few messages from the Marconi system, and around this time, they're getting ready to abandon the uh, the Marconi room, and then, of course, the scuffle with the Stoker over a life jacket, and they finally abandon it because that water is coming, and if they stay there any longer, they're going to die. Now, after that happened, they both went their separate ways. Bride helped out with one of the collapsible lifeboats on the uh, port side, and Phillips went off i don't know if he went to uh the other side to help out or ran to the stern this is what what we can see collapsible lifeboat b and it's just about to topple over to hand upside down and i think that's what we'll probably go see in the minute 
Now, with the band as well, you can hear in the background as well, and um, that they are starting to play Nearer My God to Thee. And um, as we all know, since that song was being played, um, the musicians would drown because, um, yeah, Sabrina. Question. Why did they not have a viable way of getting the collapsible boats off the officer's quarters roof? They just kind of fucked them down and hoped for the best. Yeah, actually. There was no way to get them off. Look, there's no davits, no nothing. They're just sitting there. DK. Alright, I run that moment when a collapsible B landed upside down. It actually pinned Harold Bride upside down as well. So basically, he's trapped, and yikes, there's some gunshots already, right, but I'll cover that next. Anyway, Bride kind of, you know, stayed upside down, waited for the water to go up to him, and then he finally managed to, to go back up to the surface and finally climb up on Collapsible B. And the gunshots that you heard was from Murdoch to this very day. Its intended targets are very unknown. And then you can see in the Collapsible Lifeboat A, um, it was pulled down and then, and then it was stopped. And all of that. Jake? Um, yeah, you're just you're gonna see in a moment. I think you, we may have actually seen it. The Titanic is gonna correct itself. Um, she will level it, level herself where she's just gonna go nosedive. Um, passengers recollect seeing as if it was, as a, as a huge wave come up, and then it seemed to be where the Titanic sort of uh, as as she dipped, she she lifted herself again just slightly. Uh, at the at the bow, um, with the, the bridge came up slightly again, and then it went. Then she just took this huge nose nose dive forward, and that's when she was really going under. Um, and obviously, you're going to see the uh, the base now. I don't know why she corrected herself. I don't know why there was a shift. Um, maybe there was a shift of weight inside the ship. I don't know. There's no real reason why or we don't know why she just suddenly went from port to then um leveling itself so we don't know um might have just been a shift of a shift of weight see some people are running back to the stern now to try and get on the rails now this has been featured so many um times but mostly in greater detail in the 97 film and um uh, you can see that um, in the models of the people, they're rushing as fast as they can to try and get to the end as much as possible. And the, apparently there was a testimony uh, that says they were like a swarm of bees, which is quite tragic, if, if you like, uh, ask me, very tragic. Um, oh, that would be Jack Stair. Oh, of course, yes, I forgot about that. Okay, so the Marconi room, is being flooded up just there. That will be the room where uh, Jack Phillips and Harold Bride would have been in. And I think that's, um, I've seen this one. The system has gone out completely. Sparks have gone everywhere near the wireless set and it's just completely gone. And the power is about to completely go off in like two or one minute or so, two minutes, roughly. And then you can see the honour and glory clock just, I'm thinking, underneath the water. Oh yeah, so probably the last five minutes. Now, you can hear in the background, as well as people screaming, the structure is starting to break ever so slightly and the break is getting louder and louder. Honestly, there are no other words to describe this. Yes, now the funnels. Um, that's happened like the last one. Some people were, a few, were crushed by the funnels. And one of them is believed to have been John Jacob Astor. Well, actually, that might be um, slightly false. Um, it was said that his body was covered in soot. Mm, it, we, we don't know how how uh, Asta came to his end, but um, people. I mean, I don't think uh, 
there was soot on his body um and we don't think he was crushed by the funnel it we again it's one of them we don't know but i think the crushing of the funnel i, I think that may have been proven wrong and it's been debunked oh, okay so I could be wrong. Okay, so we've just seen the Titanic split in half, and uh, that must have been quite scary. So, in the few videos that I've watched about the structure, some of them have been light, but this one seems to be a little bit of a jerk of some kind, and that was based on a testimony um, by a George Simmons, I think, because he testified in the in Titanic inquiry um, that um, he saw like the poop deck going up a little bit, but. Um, just but with the stern when it split, the back end of the Titanic was kind of like a little jog. DK, you put your hand up. Yeah, this is the uh, total structural failure that I mentioned about. Now, it wasn't actually total, and ha it actually started from the boat deck and descended its way down to where the uh, the double bottom is. Now, the double bottom is actually holding on like a banana peel. Basically, the banana peel theory from uh, James Cameron. Oh, yeah, which yeah. Actually, which actually does have something to do with it. And then the uh, two uh, bowhouse structures, one of them that actually where the third funnel stood up at, and also, of course, where the aft grand staircase is, also broke off as well, which is basically nothing but a mangled pile of mess. Now, people do say that the Titanic did split in two. Yes, there was actually the two major structures, but they never looked at the uh, other two structures that were also broken off from the ship as well. And, oh my God, prepare for a jump scare. Oh my god! That's death. Oh gosh, and that's one of the li last funnels that were that just collapsed. Oh god. Now, I've seen like a few scenes at the end so many times, but that is definitely the most scariest thing I've ever seen, really. Even more scarier than the HFX Studios version. <laughs> Sabrina says in the chat, that's terrifying if anyone was in there. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so um, they're quite just there now from uh, J. Bruce Ismay. Uh, he said he had his turn uh, back turned to the way of the boat um, because he did not wash, uh, wish to see the Titanic go down. Now, as you can see, there are a lot of people just screaming and um, the bow's already um, going under right about now, but it's just the stern that's just right at the top. And it won't be long before the stern actually sinks. Oh, DK says in the chat, the stern is almost vertical at this moment and it's the beginning of its final descent. Yes, that's it. That's um, the, the great explanation to um, explain it. And... Um, it's um the gravity of the weight is definitely pulling itself down and it must have been very terrifying and of course with it being in the dark and no one can see anything because the lights have gone out it's just so unbelievable and you can see in the animation as well there are people who are already in the water and even though when the stern goes down the people who are already in the water might have been sucked down with the titanic dk Due to popular belief, they actually did fear that the uh, suction would pull them down. However, the, uh, the Mythbusters, uh, Adam Savage and Jamie Heideman, they actually already done test that. I think the only way to be sucked down in this case is like if you're stuck in a room or basically the rigging that is still on the stern itself can actually do pull you down. And this is like from a... Uh, from their earlier years, not this was like, yeah, it was the early years, not when they did the uh, the whole uh, door debate with uh, James Cameron later on. And then it's just going into its final stages, and you can hear like the weight um, of the Titanic stern as it's pulled down by the water. Honestly, there are no other words to describe this. 
Sabrina says, um, Sir James Cameron did some test on the door debate recently, which was interesting. Yes, that was with Jack and Rose. We'll definitely have to do another video on that another time, I think. That will be a really good video idea. Yeah, I think that documentary was the uh, Titanic 25 years later that they actually tested everything that's been going on. On, uh, on the ship itself. It basically actually took 20 minutes just to set a lifeboat up individually. Now, even if Ty even if Titanic were to have enough lifeboats, they still wouldn't have enough time to get them all out and ready. It's really true. And then there's the final plunge now. And it's getting up to that point, really, that once the stern is under, um, all the people in the water um, well, most of them would succumb to ice burn or hypothermia, and then only a few would be pulled into the lifeboats. And then it would have been like a short amount of time until the Carpathia arrives on the scene. Well, Sabrina says in the chat, um, basically uh, they were lucky enough to get 18 out of 20% uh, off, yes. And um, uh, only, from what I understand recently, the only lifeboats that returned to pick up survivors was lifeboats 4 and 5. 15 so um because i always thought it was 15 but recent researchers found out that lifeboat 4 actually came back as well it so, was lifeboat sorry it says it was lifeboat 14 that came back to the rescue as well as lifeboat 4 oh oh yeah 14 yeah. sorry but apologies <laughs> yeah so uh, there were the only two lifeboats that came back and uh but um it, it's just so tragic really and then there we go that's the end of titanic And then um, there are people who will be waiting a li and in the lifeboats or who, are, who died in the water, which I mentioned earlier. And then that will probably go on for a while. And then the Carpathia picked uh, some of the passengers up after 4 a.m. And all of them didn't go on board until 8.30 a.m. And you're just about to see the image of the Carpathia coming up out. There we go. Definitely a beautiful sight. Honestly, I have no other words to describe this, but it's a really sad but beautiful end to the video and the live stream as well. Right, I think I'm trying to get out of the face. I think that's the end with the live stream. So, yeah, it's been really great fun. I know Sam didn't actually come back, really, but it was great to have him on. But I want to give, like, a massive big thank you to everyone who came on. So, Jake, DK, Hannah, Sabrina, thank you so much. And once again, thank you so much to everyone um, at the Titanic Honour and Glory team to um, actually use the footage for the live stream again. It's been a really great pleasure to do this, especially on the first anniversary of the YouTube channel as well. So, yeah, so it's been really great. It says, thank you for having us on. And Sam, I know he thank didn't you. came back. Thank you, dude, for coming on. Even if thank it wasn't like that. <laughs> oh, oh well but yeah so apart from that we all will say goodbye so take care everybody and i hope you have a lovely day take care bye bye <laughs> bye